about it that way. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, I've been going through midterms too. I uh, you know I know it sucks. Hopefully everybody um, is out of it now or is about to yet. Well I guess you must be. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's seven o'clock in front. Um, I'm growing this beard. It's like for all my fallen brethren. Um, yeah. Uh, so we're going to get started. Uh, today is kind of like a, a different kind of meeting. So and not, not really that different. We don't really have a guest speaker. Um, but at the end, uh, I'll be walking you through a couple of like CTF challenges and everything. Uh, we've also got uh, Adam, also known as Southern Yoda, uh, on GitHub and on the Discord, uh, who is going to be doing uh, a project then. And then Nick is also going to be doing uh, like an extended version of um, his Rick's Random Repo Rundown. <laughs> uh, and it's going to be actually on C2, so you're going to like Get, you know, if you're going to the workshop next week, you're going to kind of like get a little bit of an understanding of, of what that looks like. Um, and then, of course, uh, both of them will be doing the news roundup, uh, as always. Um, so to move on to the announcements. Oh, the clicker. Um, so yeah, don't forget the, uh, the workshop next week. Uh, if you're already signed up, there's still like three spots, I think. Uh, if, if, uh, you know, if you still want to sign up, there's like 30 people there. Um, but whatever. Um, don't forget the setup is going to be uh, on Thursday at 7. Uh, the, the actual like setup document is already on the Discord, so you can download that. Um, if you know you have never used AWS before, I would just recommend, um, as Nick mentioned last time, to just wait until the setup time because there's going to be that, and then even if that's not enough, I think Lee is also making like a video that you guys can call. Okay? So there is no excuse to not be prepared that morning. Um, for requirements, you probably should have Kali Linux installed. Uh, the only reason for, for that is because uh, you are going to be using Metasploit. Um, so, and maybe like, I don't know, read like a cheat sheet on Metasploit. He's not going to get in like super depth, but know like how do you like do that initial exploit and how to like search for exploits. Like any basic cheat sheet will show you how to do that. Okay, super, super easy. It's like four lines that you have maybe just actually print out that cheat sheet, or maybe I'll provide that cheat sheet, I don't know. Um, the other good news uh, is that we got like a really big grant from the SSU, which allows us to do a lot of cool things, actually $2,500, which is insane. Um, yeah, and uh, so there's definitely gonna be food at that workshop. Um, I don't know what the food will look like yet. Uh, probably, <laughs> <laughs> probably. Pools of gruel. Uh, no, I'm, I'm working. Maybe, maybe I'll get you guys kebab. I don't know if that's like a popular idea. Uh, uh, there's like a me. what's that? Uh, uh, for you, okay. I'll see. I don't know. I'll ask. Uh, it's a, sorry. Taza Express. Taza. Okay. okay. <laughs> as an Arab, as a Syrian, Taza sucks. Okay. <laughs> I just have to say this right now. Like Taza, you know, you go to Taza, it's just like yeah, street food, right? But you need, you need to have like actual. It's the food. only walking distance to waffle. Yeah, I know, I know. Because you don't get it, you fall off. It's true, it's true. Um, yeah. But the Pina Nuts are right across the street. They're like a little bit farther. So. I've never been to that one, actually. That's a really good place. Is it? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, but like, I don't, I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't know. Um, OK, so yeah, and that, that's, that's it for the workshop. Um, the next announcement uh, is you know, our CTF. Uh, how many people here actually signed up for the CTF? We are. Awesome, all right, yeah. perfect. Um, so we're sold out, uh, there is a wait list. If you still have like somebody who needs to get uh, into your team, right, like they signed up too late or whatever, um, I can't guarantee that they're gonna make it, but please uh, just let them message me so that I can add them to that wait list, okay? There's five people on there. There's usually like a 10% no-show rate or whatever. Um, so there's a good chance that you, you can still make it. Um, which actually brings me to another point. This is like a really important event, okay? So for the people that are here, please tell all your friends, right? We have legitimately like 30 people coming from the sponsors, 
Okay, we have spent, we're gonna spend roughly about $5,000 on this thing. So, please, 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 if you said that you were gonna show up that day, show up that day, okay? I have made a commitment to you to organize a team, and that team has worked for the last eight months to put this event together. What you can do for me is you can show up that day. It's a free event. I expect it from everybody. So please do it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and yeah, that's it for the announcements. Um, let's move on to uh, the news roundup with Nick and Adam. Okay, hi, everybody. How's it going? Everybody's good. You finished your midterms, more or less, unless you're in my class, in which case they're after reading week. I know. I know, because you're supposed to read for your midterm over reading week. That's the whole point. Is that what it's about? Yeah, you're supposed to study yeah. for the test during that week. Also that week. Yeah. That. <laughs> also that. Okay, uh, so news. Um, we were trying to be nice and not cover like a month's worth of news, so we only got like a few stories. So the first one, um, leaked documents expose the secret market uh, for your web browsing data. Now, this is nothing new. We all know that lots of companies like to buy all of our browsing and personal information, but the source of this one was actually really interesting. So the, everybody knows the Avast antivirus solution. Lots of people liked it because it was free, it was cool. Uh, they also had a plugin that you could incorporate into your browser that would try to you know, keep you from browsing to bad sites. However, it came bundled with a um, sort of secondary piece of software called JumpShot. Um, and this thing was sort of leveraging the data collection capabilities of the plugin in the browser. And this entity was then selling all of that data to loads and loads and loads of organizations out there. Like everybody was buying this data and it recorded everything from like, you know, just the standard domains you were browsing to, but to keystrokes, to mouse movements, to clicks, like where on the page you were clicking. They give examples later on in the article about how they were even like within websites that have like inner website search features. They were grabbing that, just not just the straight Google searches. So this kind of, you know, you take that to its conclusion, it was people went to Pornhub and then searched for the, whatever their preference was. And they were recording that and selling that information. Now they said that they weren't capturing private information about people, but there was enough metadata there that they could definitely de-anonymize any kind of user because that's an insane amount of data like where your mouse is, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and Avast alleged that they didn't really know this was happening because it's kind of like a third party thing. And now they're sort of rolling it back and trying to undo all that. But there was like a lot of companies buying that data, uh, which sucks. Cool graphic though. I like Vice because they do cool graphics. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so this is just a quick, um, Good quick article. Yeah, about, um, so California's uh, consumer, uh, consumer Privacy Act went into effect on January 1st, and just a quick roundup. So basically what it is, it, it applies to uh, companies that uh, operate in California or have California citizens, um, they, and also they make 25 million, more than 25 million, or have uh, 500,000 people uh, per year. And basically, um, this kind of goes over like, um, part of that act is uh, users can opt out of uh, companies being able to sell their data. And so this uh, author here goes over like some of the shenanigans that goes on in regard to uh, uh, the, some of the barriers that companies put in to make it harder to, for people to opt out of uh, them being able to sell their, sell their data. So you said like some people, uh, some places, companies uh, hide links in legal language um, or like they make you do like mug shots with like your ID to prove who you are or like you have to send like an email to them or whatever. Um, like Walmart was asking for, for their astrological sign as proof of, uh, <laughs> as proof of identity. So yeah. Um, and then it also mentioned some companies that, uh, um, said that they would extend, uh, California's consumer privacy, uh, act to all of Americans. So that's good. So yeah, yeah. that is good. I mean, the more they extend it, the better for everybody. Exactly, and uh, easier for compliance. Yeah, yeah, totally. So this one's uh, kind of interesting. Um, from a, like a policy and requirements perspective, so I guess like last year, there was a, a breach into, like a data breach into some of the UN's information systems. Uh, allegedly, their, one of their sysadmins reported that you know, some malicious entity got in and was accessing data from a lot of staff, including like personal records, health info, stuff like that. 
Um, and apparently the, the breach was quite extensive. It kind of went right through their systems. But the interesting part, like, and that happens, whatever. We're used to data breaches by this point. But the interesting bit was that um, because of the structure of the UN, they kind of have this like overlaying layer of diplomatic immunity where they don't have to abide by really like the specific laws of any like one country, right? Because that's what diplomatic immunity kind of means. Um, so it also meant that they didn't have any reporting requirements when it came to being the victims of a data breach. They didn't have to inform the compromised users. They didn't really have to report it or talk about it at all because of the like extra judicial like I don't know, safety nets that they have around them. And a bunch of people were saying, well, maybe that's not great. Maybe um, you know this entity that's supposed to sort of assist with worldwide matters should be held to some kind of standard when it comes to security and privacy and safety and such. Um, so they basically, like, they didn't even report it, and a bunch of people sort of found out about it and started talking about it, which is um, interesting to think about that the UN doesn't have breach reporting requirements on it. They actually, their SharePoint got compromised, and like a couple hundred gigabytes of data, um, confidential data regarding um, also corporate, uh, some of the corporate partners that they worked with, and they didn't disclose it to anyone. Um, and like even throughout the breach, like mm -hmm. they said that um, that they just like the people that were affected, they just told them to reset their password, but didn't say why. Um, and like, yeah, it was there was a lot of stuff. Like they said, they really need to update security. Yeah, I mean, when so your internal people are referring to like your own IT people are saying it was a major meltdown. Yeah, like they were like the way they remediate they uh, mitigated was they just shut down servers. It's like oh this got pop this got popped shut down. Yeah. <laughs> So, so eh, not, not, not the most mature response. No, not, oh, well. not, not the best. Uh, yes, okay, so it's just like a quick article. Uh, so, oh no, this is a malware one. Okay, uh, so basically, like, as we know, like, uh, malware and bad apps have been plaguing the Google Play Store since its beginning. Um, and it's like, the, Google's taken more of a, a linear approach compared to Apple, but Apple also faces a similar concern in regards to uh, having apps that are, that are um, uh, spying on, on users and whatnot. So Google has been working has been working to improve that. So they're uh, improving their vetting process, and they uh, so they remove like uh, seven hundred and ninety thousand apps, um, and they part they're also partnering with third parties um, to scan uh, their app store. But they haven't reported numbers on that. So um, and then they said through their policies, like in two thousand eight, preventing apps from unnecessarily accessing private sense. Uh, private sensitive SMS and call log data. So they decreased that to like 90% coverage. Uh, so they decreased that by 98%. So it's only 2% of apps that use it. They said it, it will break their app functionality. So that's okay. nice. So yeah, it looks like it seems to be working, but they still have a lot of cleanup ahead of them. But that's good. I mean, because I didn't use the App Store for like the longest time because it was just a cesspool of like clickbait shitty apps that probably were bad, right? Yeah. So it's good that they're making it more gooder. Um, I think we've like touched on stuff like this before, but it's just terrifying to know that law enforcement agencies are using all of that open available cell phone data that is being like collected and sold to them or given to them by um, telco providers, um, especially now that it's being used by like immigration enforcement in the United States, which we know has maybe been a little bit overzealous recently, and that's putting it lightly. Um, the idea that they can then grab like cell phone data makes it even worse because you know if they're tracking one individual. Um, it it kind of makes sense that that person would maybe hang out with other people from their community who also um, might be on the border with regards to immigration status and stuff. So they can kind of like wait until one of those people is in a group of people and then like get a bunch of people, right? Like it's kind of scary. Um, so yeah, we need to deal with this whole cell phone location data um, problem. Uh, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> it's not a happy story. It's, it ends up with it sucks. Mm -hmm. That's all. Um, and then three researchers at Singapore University, or not researchers, like scientists, uh, I'm gonna call it, yeah, pretty much the same thing. Uh, three researchers uh, at Singapore University disclosed 10 security bugs related to Bluetooth low energy. Um, and this was actually in, their, in the Bluetooth low energy SDK that's been provided by vendors. Um, so in their implementation, so some of the vulnerabilities that they found was uh, they were able to crash or deadlock uh, uh, Bluetooth devices and bypass pairing security uh, by gaining arbitrary read and write access to the device themselves. So that's pretty bad. Uh, and But it mostly affected like IoT wearables and several medical and logistics providers. So not like our iPhones or Android apps or like laptops, Bluetooth implementations, more like small like IoT stuff. 
Um, they said that they worked with vendors and um, they remediated uh, with, with some vendors, but not all of them, but they waited. Um, they did a responsible disclosure, and so it's been about uh, nine months, I think, since they found those uh, bugs. And so, yeah, so now they're releasing it. And they even had a cool acronym for it right here, which is like Sweet Tooth, but and each one is supposed to be like one of a name, an acronym for like one of the vulnerabilities that they found. Hmm. So, yeah. That's cute. Yeah. Um, as a tangent or a side point, um, in the hardware world, they use the term SOC or system on chip a lot. And that's a pain in the ass when that kind of conflicts with InfoSec, where we have SOC as Security Operations Center. Um, that used to confuse the hell out of me, so that's not great. Um, yeah, <laughs> just, just putting that out there. <laughs> uh, whoa. So there's a, like some crazy new strain of ransomware that's actually been developed just to target industrial control systems. Um, so this is kind of the culmination of a bunch of stuff that we've seen happening recently, like targeted attacks on ICS systems um, and sort of the always evolving rise of ransomware. And now they think that there's actually a group of cyber criminals that are specifically writing ransomware to target ICS and control systems. The reason they think it's targeted at these systems specifically is that the ransomware ships with a bunch of extra code that looks for like process names related to specific pieces of equipment in industrial environments with the goal of like shutting down or encrypting or stopping those processes and basically deadlocking the system and asking for a ransom. Um, that's terrifying because well, like when it's nation state hackers, they're, they're after like to get in there to maybe one day do something malicious to the control system. But when it's like cyber criminals, they're just there to make like ransomware money. They don't care. They'll like, they'll lock down everything right now. They won't wait for some like, you know, country versus country action. They'll just do it because they can. Um, to make money, which is terrifying. Um, so yeah, still need more people out there doing um, SCADA and ICS security. It's not easy, but it's interesting. So you should consider that. Um, yeah, so basically um, two, two McAfee security researchers, um, they discovered that if they put um, some black tape on a stop sign like this, they're able to um, uh, trick uh, they were able to trick our, I can't talk, Tesla. Tesla, thank you. Tesla's autopilot, uh, that the speed limit is actually 85 instead of 30. Um, so, and so they responsibly disclosed this to Tesla and Mobile I, uh, Mobile I IQ3. So Mobile I provide the cameras um, and Tesla the car. Um, and so, yeah, so they disclosed it. Um, both companies kind of like, Push back a little bit and said it's not really an issue. Um, but they, when they tested it, this they tested this with Teslas that were made in 2016. Um, but when they tested it with with newer versions of the car, it wasn't susceptible. So like, you, I guess we'll see we'll see if Tesla releases a patch for 2016 and affected the uh, affected cars um, because the camera system they actually changed in the new versions of Tesla. So I mean. Bullshit, it's not an issue. Like, hands up if you've never seen a stop sign with graffiti on it. Just end of life for drivers. <laughs> I mean, it'll be end of life for the driver if they wheel through the stop sign. I just can't wait how they, like, just talk to their manager and be like, yeah, this is what I'm doing. Like, I'm pen testing by, like, putting tape, <laughs> tape on the sign. <laughs> totally justifying that salary. Um, so, yeah, so it doesn't matter. It's yeah. good. Um, so this one's kind of cool. Uh, everybody's been worried about services like 23andMe and Ancestry.com and stuff getting subpoenaed by the police and giving up all your genetic data. Um, why would police want to do that? The idea uh, from the law enforcement side is if we have DNA from a crime scene, we submit it to some of these DNA registries, not in the hopes of finding the actual perpetrator, but if you can find enough like genetic markers to identify what family they're in, then it's easier for police to put together a family tree, given all the existing information they already have, and then that where they can navigate through the family tree to at least try to identify a suspect. From the law enforcement side, you can see why that would be really beneficial and really useful. From the individual side, you can see why that would be a privacy nightmare. How do you feel about the Boston police uh, issue right now with the Peer View AI? Oh, you mean this story right there that we're gonna be getting yeah. to? Yes, <laughs> I will reserve my comments until we get there. Um, yeah, so, they tried to do this to Ancestry.com um, for a current crime that they're investigating. They're like, hey, give us data. And Ancestry.com was like, this uh, warrant is in the wrong format. You didn't serve it properly, so no, screw you. You're not getting any data. Um, so it's nice to know that at least these companies 
they are required by law to cooperate to a certain extent, but at least they're pushing back and not like bending over backwards to be super assistive. They're saying, no, you have to do it the right way because we recognize the, the importance of all this data that we're holding and it could really be misused really quickly. So it's nice that they're pushing back like that. Uh, yes, so Swapi uh, mobile voting app. Uh, so basically two MIT grad students, um, they released a report um, uh, reverse engineering the uh, votes app, uh, which has been used in West Virginia as a, under, as a pilot program for military and overseas voters, and also in votes such as Denver, parts of Oregon, uh, Utah, and Washington. Uh, so basically the company has made some cl a lot of claims that their uh, app is and system is very secure. Um, and they also said, and they also properly marketed by using buzz terms like uh, blockchain. Uh, but when the researchers actually, um, actually took a look at the code and their implementation, they noticed that they didn't really implement blockchain the way that, that, the way that it's secure to get the benefits of blockchain. Um, because it just turned out that the app interfaces with a web server using standard HTTP. So like all the votes get funneled to a centralized web server and then it goes out to the blockchain maybe. Like the security researchers couldn't pen, couldn't uh, reverse engineer the web server because then that'd be in, like in violation of uh, some, some legal laws. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. But they managed to recreate kind of a web server locally and kind of trick the mobile app to uh, talk to that, uh, talk to that and yeah, so they found that there was a poor implementation of blockchain technology, and also they found that within the app themselves, uh, it wasn't implemented very securely. So there could be ways to like bypass some of the security controls, um, and also like trick the user and like change, um, for example, how votes are registered. So like someone that pre votes for someone uh, for a specific candidate, um, the app would act they could actually trick the trick. Um, the user into submitting a, um, a vote for the, a different candidate, and even uh, it, the app would re would tell the user that their vote was properly counted. So, like just like a bunch of stuff like that. Um, and the response was, and the response from the company was, yes. Uh, quick question: Is this a team under Stephen L. Hughes for a Democratic primary in D.C. or is this a new uh, I believe that no, a that's a different one. That was written by Shadow Inc. I kid you not, that's a company name. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No, it's sketchy, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, there was like, yeah, and they also mentioned that Microsoft built a framework uh, for building voting apps, and they're like, it's actually a, not, I have looked at it, but like, people are saying that it's pretty good, so like, they should probably start leaning more towards that. Um, and so going back to the, what transpired here was uh, the company responded saying that what they reversed was an old version of the app uh, and it was not used in elections, but like they downloaded from the Google Play Store. So like where else were they supposed, to, were users supposed to download it? Um, and also they're not ver being very transparent in regards to uh, how they're responding. So not great stuff, but. Yeah. Yeah. Voting's hard. It's a hard problem in computer it science. It's stupid hard. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, so this was terrifying. Um, is everybody aware that like Google has that kind of checkout service or takeout where you can request like a downloaded copy of all the data that they have on you? Yeah. Right, so apparently if you were using this with the photos service, um, if you checked out your stuff or takeouted your stuff, takeouted, I know that sounds silly, but the service is called takeout, so just cut me some slack. It's also Friday. Um, so if you did that, there was a, like a non-zero chance that you might actually get other people's private video as part of the data that you checked out. Yeah, awesome. So that's inappropriate. Um, so uh, like it was reported, Google found it, they claimed to have fixed it. Um, there's really no detail in the article as to like what the like, root issue was. They just said that they fixed it and that's that. Um, so just, I mean, software bugs suck. Uh, one of the things you know we tend to focus on is like malicious actors. Um, stuff like this, like data integrity, is still part of our purview as information security people. So it's just one thing to keep in mind, right? Like when I initiate some kind of transaction, I want to make sure that the data that I retrieve is accurate and complete and not like over complete, meaning I've gotten other people's video. So that's just as important, oftentimes more so than like safeguarding against the hackers because this happens all the time. Um, I mean, code's hard, right? Like every piece of software I've ever written to me feels like it's hung together with like 
tissue paper and dental floss. Like I'm terrified of any program I've ever written. Yeah. Um, and they operate yeah. at such a large scale too. Yeah. Like even like a small bug like can just have a huge impact. Totally. Um, so going back to hopefully a, a better story, um, oh, OpenSSH is adding support for FIDO and, uh, and two-factor authentication. So FIDO is kind of like a two-factor uh, biometric standard. Um, so, and that's being developed. And so it's going to be released for version 8.2. It allows users to authenticate using like hardware tokens. Um, and also they're um, retiring some old insecure um, authentication me me uh, mechanisms such as like SHA-1 or SSH RSA. So. Yeah. 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 So these things, if you're familiar with YubiKeys, basically SSH supports these now, mm -hmm. these hardware tokens. So mm -hmm. like you can't see my laptop, but I have one plugged in and I just touch it with my finger and that's me doing my second yeah. factor. So I don't have to like take my phone out and do the six digit thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really nice. I mean like second factor, like Microsoft is touting that like uh, if for users that enable like second factor for like their uh, uh, I believe Microsoft account like they have like a 99.9% .9 uh, like um, they've reduced uh, account compromise by 99.99% by users using 2FA um, so like it seems to be working yeah it works real good yep yep um, this one's neat so I, like a long time ago, we, we did a news story on people doing the relay attacks to steal cars uh, with the key fobs. Um, now there's this person named Evan Connect who's actually selling kits to thieves to make this process easier. And they did a video demo and they got a little bit more info about like how the current like setup works. And it's actually really interesting. It's, it's funny because it's a problem that we've solved in like software web browsing, but I guess hasn't been solved at like the hardware Wi-Fi communication level before. So it's really neat. Um, the way the, the gear works is that uh, one bad guy stands like near the car with this little handheld device and the other bad guy stands as close as they can get to like the front door of the home where they want to steal the car. And the person near the car, their handheld device emits the like low frequency signal that initiates sort of the, the key handshake with the car. And the car, you know, sends back the challenge, which is the, the key would normally respond to and open, unlock the car. So what this little device does is it receives the low frequency message from the car. It sort of converts it into like a, a hi-fi signal and it broadcasts it to the other handheld unit that the person by the door is holding. And that unit is hopefully close enough to the key that it can then like downgrade back um, to like a low frequency signal and send it to the key receive the key's response, send it back over the hi-fi to the person with the other handheld unit, and that will kind of like finish negotiating the handshake with the car. Basically, they've built it like a bridge between the door of the car and as close as they can get to wherever the physical keys are in the house. And it's real. <laughs> it, um, so it's interesting because like that kind of thing, like if we look back at like old school browsing, we would call that like a man in the middle attack. Um, and we've solved that, you know, with uh, cryptographic, uh, digital certificates and, and PKI and stuff like that. So they're probably gonna have to then implement something like that um, for this whole automobile um, car unlock capability because that's literally the same process. It's a man in the middling like radio signals, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's a Windows 7 bug that prevents users from shutting down or rebooting their computers. I think if we scroll down, we'll see like a screenshot where it basically says, no? I think it was this oh, video. Oh, it was the other one. Oh, hold on. okay. oh, there's a, you mean this article here? Yes. So it just basically says that you don't have the correct <laughs> privilege to shut down or reboot your computer. I'm saving this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's going to be so useful. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like, and because it's out of life, like, this bug just showed up and, um, and yeah, we'll see if Windows actually fixes it. So upgrade to Windows 10, right? Yeah, totally. That's the solution. That's amazing. By the way, you can do the same thing in Linux. If you do like chmod everything in the system, 777, you actually can't reboot the machine, which is fascinating. Um, you can explore why as an exercise to the listener, but yeah, you can do that. Yeah. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, my turn. Uh, so the Emotet like botnet malware service um, is probably like one of the worst things out there right now because it ships with all kinds of crazy exploit kits and has lots of advanced capability um, for like infecting and ransoming and just doing like malicious stuff. 
it's recently adopted a new behavior because this is what modern malware does. It evolves and adapts and gets new behaviors. Now, when like a device is compromised, so imagine like my laptop right here um, is compromised, it will start, it won't like just do communications over the internet anymore. It will now start looking for other local Wi-Fi networks and it will try to like brute force its way into those Wi-Fi networks and then look for new victims that way. So it's like a whole different mechanism for pivoting into a new target and finding new targets for the malware to spread. Um, there's a graphic in the article right here. So like this is the compromised victim. So now it will start looking for all the Wi-Fi networks in range, trying to crack them and then spread into those networks, which then, you know, become infected and, and can spread the rest of the regular way across the network with its traditional um, compromising capability, which is fascinating. Um, I mean, it sucks if this happens to you, but it's really neat that it's adapted and evolved this behavior. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, keep securing the Wi-Fi's. Mm -hmm. Yep, um, and then there's a Windows 10 bug um, in the newest uh, uh, release. Uh, so basically some users uh, report that um, their user profile and data is being hidden after they install a patch. Uh, the patch is uh, KB4532693. Um, Thank you. <laughs> no I'm just sounds like I'm gonna remember that. I'll remember <laughs> that. I just thought it was entertaining. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, and so basically the info is not actually deleted. It's just like be, while the patch was installed, like the user account uh, got renamed in a temporary uh, directory. And so basically the advisory is just uninstall the update. And then uh, Microsoft has already uh, pulled the update. Just uh, roll back and then you'll be, your account should show up. Um, so basically like if you see the bug, it would be like your wallpaper would disappear. Your install app, installed apps wouldn't show up. Your desktop files downloads in your documents folder would just be hidden in this temporary directory. Oh, is that um, all? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, it's just a minor inconvenience. Yeah, yeah. It's a gigantic <laughs> I mean, your nice. username's like blank, so you're really anonymous. That's actually kind of yeah. <laughs> desired behavior. Last update. What's that? Yeah. Better than the last bug update that deleted everyone's documents. <laughs> it's an improvement, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting better at patches. Yeah, it patches are still dangerous. Reason. Yep. This is why we test patches before we apply them. I mean, that's why they have two different streams. Yeah, they have the, the consumer and then... Yeah, and the, like, the paid tier. Yep. Um, so that's Moxie Martin Spike, if nobody knows who that is. Um, he created Signal. So Signal, the secure messaging app um, that was like kind of started and then they took some of the capability and like bundled it into WhatsApp and whatever. Um, good news for them. They've basically been running on a three-person dev team since Signal started. I had no idea their team was that small. I thought it was way bigger than that. And everybody was like crazy overworked. And given that, the fact that the app's been like pretty stable and amazing and everything is, is a miracle. Now, um, the, one of the WhatsApp co-founders who's kind of like left Facebook after Facebook acquired WhatsApp is now one of the directors of sort of this signal board and he donated 50 million to them to allow them to continue upgrading and actually like really working on the project. So now they hired like 20 engineers to start working on signal. So if you've noticed that the app has gotten a bunch of updates recently, like the stickers and, and a bunch of just other capabilities, it's because they hired a slew of new devs to continue working on it and making it even better. Allegedly, they're going to start working with like a, um, one of the features that people really like about other texting platforms is to have like group chats and make them work properly in Signal, which is really cool. Um, they are, they've added the ephemeral video and image capability for like the self-destructing images and videos and stuff, which people like um, for naked reasons. Um, and they added another feature, or they're adding another feature that I forget. Oh, store, no, storing encrypted contacts in the cloud. Oh yeah, and you can respond with reaction gifts now, which yes. is amazing, because I want that to be end-to-end -end encrypted so nobody knows how bad my selection of reaction gifts is. <laughs> um, but like storing your contacts encrypted is really useful too. Um, so that's that was meant to be the last story and end on a good note, um, but then a couple people mentioned this one, so we're gonna end on a down note. Um, I didn't read this, but a couple people mentioned it, so I don't know. Anybody that knows more about the story than me. I think it's not great, but if anybody wants to talk about it, go so for it. Basically, it's been found out that some police, well, technically, this is only a private sector uh, facial recognition software, but some police departments, such as, um, I believe, OPP, has been found using it secretly uh, for uh, their databases. Uh, and so, obviously, there's concerns about privacy in terms of using this in public uh, 
forest as well as uh, private as well. So uh, privacy commissioner, I believe the federal privacy commissioner as well as uh, British Columbia, Alberta, and Quebec. Uh, Ontario is not doing it because their privacy legislation does not cover private sector uh, software. Go Ontario. So there's that. Uh, but yeah, they just are launching an investigation now. Uh, it also will cover, uh, they want to set out guidelines on how to use uh, facial recognition uh, or public as well. Just to add to that, there's still the bias regarding facial recognition and genetics. Yeah, because uh, usually for the test data. So if you're not sure what that means, the, the test data set for like facial recognition software tends to always be white dudes. So facial recognition software is really bad at telling people who apart who are not white dudes. So back in, uh, I think we've seen in the past, there's been stories where like the success ratio on, when like deployed publicly has been horrible. Like it's been like maybe 40% successful or something oh, like no, that. that or, I've seen worse. And, yeah, there were ones that were like, like, way worse. It was like four out of five matches were wrong. Yeah. It was, yeah, so the fact that they're using this kind of stuff for law enforcement reasons is concerning and mm -hmm. not great. Yeah. And we had a comment in the back. Yeah, do you want to? Oh, 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 I remember reading in the conference, this is actually going to be a big meeting on it. Um, the Halton Regional Police have been using it because it was still a bank robbery. Mm -hmm. So what they've been trying to do is corroborate the footage from the bank robberies with this, this test data set. Um, and hilariously enough, and like this is just the, the article I read, most of the perpetrators were black, so they actually think it was useless. Because the test set is mostly white Caucasian males of a certain age, yeah. and these guys were younger uh, black males, so they feel like this didn't work. Mm -hmm. And then they ended up coming up with the public now they've been using it in secret. But it's like there's no there's no interaction from the public on the use of not only our data, but like how the law enforcement is going about this. Yeah. Definitely. And I think that's why, at least in some of the other provinces, the privacy commissioners have gotten involved because there's all kinds of other ex implications, like how are they storing the data? Who's in charge of like Regardless of like if you believe with the practice or not, they're now custodians and stewards of this incredibly private and personal data because that kind of stuff can be used for biometrics and all kinds of other stuff. So like, are they stewarding that data appropriately in accordance with you know all of our privacy legislation and stuff? Like, just crazy. So yeah, um, let's hope that this kind of gets addressed in a way that's acceptable for the public and in a way that law enforcement just has to deal with. Yeah, yeah. cool. Um, so that's the news. Um, do we just, uh, I have mine on here. Sure. And then I'll just do mine first. And okay. Do your thing. Cool. Sounds good. All right. Um, give me like two seconds here while I just take a breath and get set up. Um, I just want to go get to my break. Yeah, sure. If wants to just take it like a break for a couple minutes, so you can go to the washroom and then we'll get started with the repo worn down. Um, and you can read the giant description in the meantime. Big words. Sick logo too. I like when they do logos.
Signed up for the bankers. Thing. Hold on, let me just. Uh, can people? Uh, we signed up for the bankers thing, but you've graduated. It said on the thing oh. if you graduated within the last two years. Oh, nice, sick. I didn't even see that. Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, I'm glad you said that. Right? So, yeah, I mentioned that somebody taking G's like, yeah, let's exploit that. You know? No, I don't want anyone else from the KPMG and just you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, but that's cool. we're going to meet, run through some ideas. We might run them by you. I would love Because honestly, I don't know like, if some of our ideas have already been attempted and failed. At the I mean, and again, you it's only it doesn't even have to be at the bank specifically. It's just no. anything in general. And all you need to start is just five slides on part. Yeah, right? five so, slides yeah. and then they click and then they yeah. send it off. What's up? Not much. You're like five pounds. I know, I know, I lost it. I've lost like 50 pounds. It's too much pain. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just, uh, just, just... I just can't get out of my room. <laughs> no, it's fair. No, just, I don't know. Uh, I just started eating better and exercising, and I feel really good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta walk up the mm -hmm. stairs here. Should yeah. we call your classes on the top floor? On the top floor, floor. yeah. Do <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. I'll keep you up. yeah, no, I'd love to talk to you guys about your ideas. So you know, send we have two people on the team, mm -hmm. and you can have up to four. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I don't know if any other people have to I mean, if, yeah, and if somebody wants to post in Discord that you're starting a group for it and looking for yeah. some more team members, that's probably a really good way to do that. Yeah, you know? I'll post Because that's how you'll get the more engaged people, because they're the ones that are on there talking yeah, yeah. and working on stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I should mention that, though. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, that. okay, so, like, yeah. So, recent grads, two years. Yeah. And people still in school, of course. Thank you. earlier with me not being able to find your email address I just put Nicholas C. Johnson and that worked for a future reference that's my like personal github though oh so, so not the, to use that oh well you can I just oh. but I use the account that I created for um, the class and it's just, cause it's just easier it helps me sort it but I don't care either way so that, it doesn't matter which one I use the prog or the Nicholas no it doesn't, it doesn't matter Um, is everybody cool if we like start again? Is that all right? Awesome. Um, one thing uh, I probably should have mentioned during the announcement thing, um, and if you're in the program, you might have gotten an email from me about this. Uh, the Canadian Bankers Association is having or hosting what they call their cybersecurity challenge. And this is my pitch to all of you that you should really consider doing this. Um, and I just also like two seconds ago found out that it is permitted for not just uh, current students in security programs, but also for people who have graduated within uh, two years. So if any alumni are watching or listening, um, this is available to you as well. So the idea is you and a group of up to four people um, just put together a five slide PowerPoint deck about just an idea you have for security across either mobile, network, or web security. It doesn't need to be related to banking at all, just an idea you have in any of those three categories, and you submit it to this contest uh, by March the 1st, and then they will take the top 30 and then move them on to like the top 30 ideas that they like, and then move them on to round two and three, where you get to kind of flesh out your idea and maybe work on a little bit more, and the kind of top couple uh, submissions or projects will present in April and there's the opportunity to get some money and to meet people in the banking industry if that's an area you're interested in going to work or just get some like intense personal accreditation and mad mad props for that. Um, I would strongly recommend everybody give this a shot because literally you have nothing to lose. If you have like a crazy out there idea for a security thing you want to try, screw it, do it. Um, because the, like, the available pool of people who can do this is really small, right? There's not many security programs in post-secondary academia in Ontario right now um, or in Canada. So like 
every submission has a really good chance of getting picked. Um, so yeah, and if you're in like fourth year working on your capstone, oh my goodness, just submit your capstone as is with no question. Like just do it. You might just get money for your capstone. Yeah. Well, you say idea, you mean if you have a developer idea or just having like the first submission is just five PowerPoints over just your general high level concept. You don't have to have anything fleshed out. It's just basically so they can do like a first phase kind of triage of like what sounds like a reasonable idea or not. So uh, yeah, the initial admission is really like low barrier. Yeah. Yeah, one to four people. Yeah, so again, if you have a friend who wants to just get paid money, then that's cool too. Anyways, yeah, um, just forgot to mention that earlier, but it's really cool. I strongly encourage everybody to do that. The initials um, for submission would be in nine days. So, hey, if you're, like, bored over Reading Week, you should do that. And I, can, I can just plug in. I actually work for Team Bent, and we're recruiting. Amazing. So, uh, computer forensics and uh, social Well, thanks for joining us, and forensics is a fun job. You should totally do forensics. That's what I did before I, like, gave up the life and became a teacher. Forensics is super fun. Uh, okay, so, uh, repo rundown for this week. Uh, I chose a project called BYOB, which stands for bring your own botnet, or build your own botnet. Um, they have a fun logo, look at the logo, it's neat. Um, the actual GitHub repo is Malwared uh, LLC, which is this person, Daniel. Um, the idea is that this is a tool that's meant to help researchers and developers understand how botnets and command and control servers and stuff like that work, and allows you to um, build it and use it in a sort of a safe and controlled environment. Um, they even have a disclaimer at the start of the project, though, that this is just for testing and education purposes. Because if you know how botnets and command and control servers work, then you're more equipped to learn how to like safeguard against them. I mean, you could maybe use this to start tuning rules in your security op center or for your um, incident management stuff. So that's cool. Um, they specify that like right here. The, and basically, the, the software does two things. One, it runs the actual command and control server that's used to control your botnet. And the other is it gives you a tool that will create what we call a RAT, or a remote administration tool, or some call, call it a remote access trojan, whatever you want to call it. Um, so you can create like a little agent that gets deployed on nodes that have been compromised, and then you control it through the C2 server, C2 standing for command and control. Um, and it comes with all kinds of crazy cool features, and the author also wrote it in a way that it works with Python 2 or 3. So whatever the installation is, it will support that. Um, and actually, it can also work. It can be built in such a way that um, it can be deployed on like a compromised host, and it doesn't even need to be running Python. Um, you can compile it into an executable. Um, so some of the features of the client that gets deployed out to the target machines, it will support dynamic module loading. The idea is you ship a tiny little executable onto someone's machine, and then that executable then goes and talks to the C2 server to download all its capabilities and all its behaviors and stuff so that you can ship a small executable with no info in it. Um, and it like sort of builds itself after it's been deployed. It operates in one of these fileless modes so that aside from the original little program that runs, nothing hits the hard disk. Everything is done in memory. So like all the modules and code that, that, are, that are downloaded are loaded as dynamic modules in RAM. You don't actually download, nothing hits the hard disk, which is a pain in the ass from a forensic perspective because then you do all the disk forensics in the world and you don't see anything. Um, it basically has no dependencies because when you build the initial dropper, it, it kind of comes with like a standalone runtime environment. So like I said, you don't even need to be running Python on the compromised system. As long as it'll run this little executable that you can build for any operating system, it's fine. Um, it will do real-time updates so the client itself will pull the C2 server regularly looking for like, hey, are there new mods that I can use? Like are there new capabilities that this thing can take advantage of, which is really cool. From a capability perspective, not from like a bad guy using it perspective. Um, platform independent, so it'll work on like Linux, Windows, uh, and Mac, and even smartphones, which is crazy. And it also does all kinds of crazy like hiding itself features. So first off, the client itself, when it deploys on the target or victim machine, which we'll just call a node from here on out, so I don't have to say five other words, um, it makes an outbound TCP connection. So that pretty much means all the firewall rules will just let it leave. Um, we block stuff on the way into the network, not on the way out, because who wants to make networks slow? Um, it also like will block AVs from starting. Um, so if it sees the name of an AV process in the process list, it'll try to kill it or prevent it from doing stuff. Um, it encrypts the payloads that it downloads, so it'll try to bypass, again, signature detection and stuff. It also has capabilities for trying to do like anti-reverse engineering. Um, they're kind of ghetto anti-VM detection. Basically, it just looks to see if there's like 
um, like a process named like VMware or whatever running on the host. They can add more stuff to it, but it has basic VM detection, um, which is kind of cool because um, normally we analyze malware in VMs, right? Um, there's mod so actual payloads, like once this thing's deployed, stuff it can do. It can turn on a key logger, it can take screenshots, it can record from a webcam, it can deploy like a pretend ransomware vi variant. Um, it will like, it, if the person has Outlook installed, it can connect to Outlook, grab all the contacts, and then send itself out via the Outlook contacts, uh, contacts kind of like a traditional worm would do. So it's got like worm behavior, it'll do packet capture, it's got persistence mechanisms, so if it's deleted, it can regenerate itself through like embedding itself in the registry and, and cron jobs and stuff like that. Um, if it does land on a smartphone, it knows how to look for SMS messages and then send those off to some central server. It'll do privilege escalation, so if it's a regular user, it'll try to become root or the sysadmin. It's got a port scanner, it can control processes, like start and stop them. It can look for iCloud accounts and then like pillage all the stuff in an iCloud account, um, the worm behavior, and it can also even just deploy a crypto miner if you want to just like make Bitcoin money. Um, so like the it ships with a lot of crazy modules by default, and the author also built the ability to add modules to it really easily. It's crazy. Um, if you're not really sure how C2 servers and stuff like that work, it's kind of like this. Um, bad guy sets up a central server and then builds all these little clients and through some means gets them on target machines, either through like phishing emails or like... I don't know, just like on USB sticks. However, bad guys get an executable onto a system these days. You run it, and then from that point on, the client connects outbound to the C2 server. We've now established a connection that is all like encrypted and secured. Everything's sent over HTTPS, so it looks like regular web browsing traffic, so it's hard to detect. At that point, once it's connected, we have like a session established. The control server then sends commands out either to individual machines or it can do like broadcast commands to all of the nodes in the network. And they will run whatever that command is and then send the results back to the C2 server. So it's like a central administration point for your botnet. That's what C2 servers do. Okay. Um, but again, the client program can be a Python program or it can actually just be a standalone executable. Um, so it's got a couple of me mechanisms that it can ship as. Probably wouldn't be that much more difficult to like convert this into like a word macro as well. So it would work with um, macro office macros and stuff. Sweet, the stream's still working for once. Um, so the organization of the code repo, standard stuff, like there's, you know, the licenses and the readme files, but then there's BYOB, and in there, there's a couple of folders. Core is just all the, like, base behaviors and capabilities. There's cross-comp, which is, uh, like, a little directory that's mostly meant to help you build the executable for different environments, like OS X and Linux and, and Windows. Modules are all the, basically, the payloads available to you. Um, if you were going to make your own payload, you would just put it in here. Other stuff, there's requirements, which I'll cover in a second. There's client.py and server.py. So server.py is the actual C2 server. Client.py generates the endpoint clients for you. So again, do you want like a standalone Python file? Do you want an executable? Do you want an ELF file for Linux? It generates those. And then you go and you deploy that. Um, it uses a load of libraries, but luckily only like the server needs these and then the actual executables bundle up whatever they need. But I learned about some cool libraries this way. I love reading requirements.txt files because then I learn about cool Python stuff people know of. Like MSS is a library that will just do cross-platform screenshots. So I don't care what platform I'm on, I can use this library and it will do screenshots for me, which is nice for abstracting from away from whatever OS you hit, which is really useful. Um, there's a library for Windows management instrumentation, so doing sneaky stuff in Windows. It uses NumPy for some reason. I didn't dig into the code enough to figure out why it needed to do science math. Maybe for some of the crypto stuff. Um, PYX hook is like a package for doing key logging in Linux. And then PY hook is a package for doing like mouse and keyboard capture in Windows. So you can do that in Python now really easy. There's Twilio, which is like a Twitter client that it can use possibly. There's Colorama for coloring terminal output because the C2 server runs in the terminal. And who doesn't like jazzed up colory terminal text? Because you always got to have like flavor with your malwares. Uh, requests is the standard Python library for making HTTP requests. Py installer is the magic that basically bundles up your Python program into like an executable program, among a few other things, but that, that makes magic happen. Um, then there's like three crypto libraries they use. There's PyCrypto, which is the standard one. There's uh, uh, PyCrypto Dome. Um, which has like other crypto capabilities and there's PyCrypto Dome X, which is just more algorithms like because they use all this for both payload encryption and building the crypto miner and building the ransomware. So like, they use crypto for stuff. There's OpenCV, which is a computer vision thing, but they basically use it to um, get the webcam streaming working. Um, I mentioned PyHook and then Py, um, 
start PyPy Win32 is just accessing the Windows API through Python. Twilio is not a Twitter client. That's is a it? Uh, VoIP service. I thought it was a Twitter client. Is it? No. Oh, my bad. When I Googled the library in, in pip, it said Twitter. Oh. My bad. Or, well, Twilio, like, the name is that, like, there's a company is called Twilio that yeah. like, can send messages to people call Twilio. Interesting. I will double check that. But when I searched in, in pip, um, it said it was a Twitter client. Interesting. I could have also just typoed it. That's entirely possible because I don't type well. Um, so a couple of the uh, behaviors in the core library. So this is what gives the program its actual functionality. There's database.py. So the server maintains just a SQLite flat file, single file database of all the sessions and connections and agents that are out there. It's not exciting, so we're not going to talk about it. Um, generators is neat. It does like code generation for bundling up and building code that gets deployed as part of the agent program, which is neat. Um, handler basically is just a, like a standalone function that allows the clients to submit HTTP requests to the server. It's not super fancy. Um, loader and payloads and stagers are all involved in building the agent program. So I'll talk about that in a few minutes because that's what, probably the most interesting part of the whole project. Um, security just has a bunch of crypto functions in it and utility is literally utility functions for doing like encoding and um, profiling of the host infected machine. Like, hey, what CPU architecture are you? Like nothing super interesting there. Um, so the server code, first off, the server displays a banner, and I always love ASCII art because flavor. A um, couple of neat things, um, if you actually want to dig into the code base yourself, this is one of the mechanisms or one of the times where they're trying to convert between Python 2 and 3 since it supports both. So every now and then you'll see these try catch blocks where they're like, the try is trying to work with Python 2. If that fails, then we have the code that works with Python 3. Um, they kind of did the same thing for some of the print statements. Like they abstracted away which version of Python you were using because from Python 2 to 3, all of a sudden we added brackets to the print statement. That blew some people's minds. Um, the actual like command line tool for the server itself, like you start it up and you can pass it a bunch of parameters like the server's IP address, the port number, the name of the database if you care, and then API keys for a bunch of services like Imager and Pastebin depending on where you're gonna upload like all your stolen data and your screenshots and stuff too. You can give it creds for an FTP server so it can push all its stuff up to an FTP server. Why it does that and not like SFTP or SCP, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, so basically when the server starts, it does a couple of things. First off, it just loads all the modules so it knows what modules are out there. Um, so it like has them in memory. Um, and then it starts a bunch of servers that basically listen for connections from the agents for various behaviors. Um, so, like, listening for requests for module downloads, um, for pulling in, like, new capabilities and stuff. So there's, like, imagine a bunch of little HTTP servers that are just listening for the agents, making various requests to it. So it actually has a lot of ports open, which is interesting. Um, it might actually be a good way if you were on a security team to determine if you found the C2 server, because the way they number the ports is basically like the base port, um, like port 80 or 443 or whatever. And then they'll just add one for this server, add two for this server, and add three for this server. So if you see like a sequence of four consecutive port numbers, maybe you found the C2 server and you're not just looking at like a proxy or something, which is kind of cool. Um, then it starts like main, it's only real goal then is to just start an instant or create an instance of the C2 object and then run it. Um, the C2 object is basically the console that the botnet operator would set and type commands into. So it just gives you a little prompt and you just type commands. Um, some of the commands that it supports are things like exit and help and debug. Those are boring. But you can type stuff like sessions and it will show you all the connected clients you have. So all the nodes that have connected to your botnet. You can type shell and that will just dump you into a shell for one of the nodes that you've connected to. If you actually just want to interact with your compromised system directly, you can get like a shell on it. So it's like a meta, it's like meterpreter if you've ever used um, Metasploit. Um, you can just type ransom and that will like deploy the ransomware module or webcam and it will start streaming web webcam from the one that you've taken. Uh, broadcast is cool. Broadcast is the ability for me to send a single command to all the nodes in my botnet. And then they will start to report back to me with the whatever was executed. So it's, it's really straightforward the way you use this thing. Um, and it's got like a built-in help support system. There's tab completion and it always blows my mind when people bundle that into like a project. It's super fun. Um, and yeah, uh, just there's some terminology between a client and a session in there, but that's not really important. Um, but like the code for that, we've covered in previous rundowns where like someone just types a command and it routes it. So it's not really interesting, the actual commands. Um, the cool part, oh, I did throw in one of the like payloads just to show you, here's how it would like deploy the ransomware. Um, 
basically you would say like ransomware encrypt, ransomware decrypt, and then the ID of the, the botnet node you want to encrypt. And it essentially just, it pushes the task out to the client. The client will receive kind of the instruction that, oh, I need to do ransomware. So then it'll reach back out to the C2 server. It will grab the ransomware module and it will just run it. That's kind of how this works. It's basically just issuing commands. It's not actually feeding them the code. It's just saying, yo, agent program, do the thing. And the agent program says, okay, give me the code to do the thing. And it pushes out the code and the agent program runs the code. That's how they keep the agent program so small, which is fascinating. Like dynamically loading code at runtime is, is really cool. So the actual client program itself, um, the high level way that it works is like the client program um, you run it on the command line, you say, hey, build me a client that supports these modules off the bat. You don't have to, like, you can add more at runtime, but if you know you want, like, the ransomware module and the screenshot module, you'll say, yo, build me a client with those. And it says, okay, fine, I'll do that. Um, and so it takes all those modules, all those imports that you listed, and it bundles them up into, like, a set of strings along with the actual payloads that you want and the capability of doing a reverse TCP connection. It grabs all that behavior and it bundles it up into, like, a Python script, okay? Then it creates what they call a stager, and the stager knows how to like download that payload, that Python script that you created, and unpack it and execute it. So that's what the stager does. So imagine the payload and the stager are very specific to the target machine that you want to infect. Right? So the stager knows how to run Python code on the host platform. The um, payload ships with the modules and the behaviors that you actually want to execute. So it assembles this thing. So imagine it's just a glorified Python script that will run code. And right now that stager with all the payload and stuff is sitting up in my C2 server. Okay? Um, after it's built the stager, it kind of spits out a URL. It says, yo, the, the stager can be downloaded from this address, from wherever the C2 server is. And then it spits out one more program. Um, the, the client builder will spit out what they call a dropper. A dropper is a really small, lightweight program that basically knows how to fetch a, uh, content from a URL and execute it. That's all this thing does. Um, so it spits out the dropper that will then, once you put it on someone's system, will reach out, grab the stager that comes with the payload, that lands on the system, it de unpacks the payload, and it executes whatever malicious code you want. So it's kind of like a, a multi-step code generation process. The idea being you deploy the dropper on the victim, dropper reaches out, grabs the staging thing that knows how to like run all the other stuff, pulls it down, and does it. That's how a lot of botnet software does operate if you want dynamic update behavior. Um, so the way it builds all this, first off, you know, you say client.py and you can give it a file name if you want. Otherwise, it will give you a random file name for the dropper, which is cool, so it doesn't look like anything. You can pass it API keys if you have them. Then you can do a bunch of weird stuff like, do you want the dropper program to be encrypted? Do you want it to be obfuscated so it encodes it in a bunch of weird ways? Do you want it compressed as well? And whether or not you want it in a raw Python script or if you want it compiled for a particular operating system. Like, do you want a Windows executable? Do you want a Mac executable? Like, what do you want? And then based on those arguments, it will spit that stuff out for you. The way it actually builds all this is like basically these six function calls. Um, modules and imports just looked at uh, the modules you've listed on the command line. It bundles all those up. Then um, if you've given any of the fancy options like encrypt, obfuscate, and compress, um, Hidden will then look into those options and it will start to apply all those to the payload. Um, then, so it will create that payload. Then the stager is where it looks at all that stuff, bundles it up, gets it ready to execute. And then if this like thing would stop popping up, I hate when it does that. How do I make this go away? <sighs> Anyways, um, the last line that you can't see there, here, I'll just do this. Um, the last line right there is the that dropper execution that builds the little dropper program. And then it just returns um, the dropper, which is um, code. Um, so if you're interested in how like some of this works, this is the few lines of Python that actually create the dropper file, not all the other stuff, because that's a ton of code. So basically it checks to see, hey, um, what kind of output did you tell me you wanted? Did you want a Python file or an AXE? So if there was, um, if like the word, uh, there's a keyword. Um, if you specify that as one of the options, um, it will see, hey, did the option end with .py? If so, it will spit out a Python file. If it didn't, then it goes down here and it will build an executable for the target system. Um, the actual dropper code itself, the dropper program is really small. This is it in between these like three quotes there and those three quotes there. That's the whole dropper, okay? Like the thing that fetches 
all of your malicious stuff and deploys it. So there's a few imports. System, um, zip, basically, base64. Uh, Marshall, which like does code loading, I think. Um, JSON and URL lib, which knows how to make HTTP requests. Um, if that's not there, it will use the request library. And all it does is it takes this code along with a URL that's over here that you can't see that it um, got when we built the stager. And it takes that URL, it sticks it right in between these brackets here, and then it takes the URL, it encodes it, compresses it, and does a bunch of other stuff like evaluates and executes it. So the actual dropper program is pretty simple. It's just you feed it a URL, and when it runs, it unpacks and deobfuscates that URL, um, fetches whatever is there, and then executes it. It's pretty pretty interesting how small this is. That would be like a really, really, really tiny program if you ran this. Um, and then it just writes it out to a file, or it compiles it into an executable, and it just gives you that file out, which is really neat. Um, as an example of one of the modules and how it works, like how this actually calls out to the modules, uh, here's the code for the screenshot utility, for example. And I mentioned earlier that it uses this library called MSS to take platform independent screenshots. So every module has like a run method to kind of do all our fancy polymorphism kind of stuff. Um, basically here's MSS um, dot MSS, I guess is the code to invoke uh, sort of the object. And you say screen dot grab and you can specify which monitor. If you say monitor zero, it's the primary monitor. And it will take that and dump it into a variable called um, data. And then we convert that into a PNG. And then it just sort of spits this out. Where does this get called from? Um, here's the actual payload program that knows how to call all of the modules. So in the payload program, um, you would have typed like screenshot or whatever, and it goes in here and it says, hey, if I have the screenshot module loaded, then do this stuff. Here's where it calls that module right here. It says screenshot.run, which was this run method right here. And that will return me that base64 encoded image. Um, here, I kind of convert that into JSON, and then depending on some settings here, we might like push that up to Imager or to the FTP server. All that's kind of configured when we first build the agent program. And it says, hey, I did the screenshot. So that's the output you would get in the command and control server. It would say, hey, screenshot complete. Um, and it would be uploaded to whatever location you want. Um, and basically, all the modules work like that. Um, there's a command that you type on the command line. It will, if that module is loaded, it will run that module. All the modules have a run function um, that just execute whatever the behavior is. And you get feedback um, at the EC2 server level. And that's kind of this program. Um, it's massive. I didn't have time to go through too much of the code. Um, but honestly, the neat stuff is mostly, if you wanted to dig into this a little bit yourself to see how you would build a, an agent program like this, this is the most interesting part right here. Um, the thing that builds the stager and the dropper. This is where it like, it learns how to fetch code dynamically from the internet and then like load these mo Python modules into memory without having files on the local file system. It's really cool. This is how it prevents all the forensic analysis on disk and stuff. So if you do feel like digging into some of this, these are the functions that you would go and look into a little bit more. The rest is kind of standard Python-y application stuff that we've looked at a bunch of times before. The dropper, yeah. The dropper, okay. Yeah. So like, the uh, like these what one two three four five lines of Python, or if it's compiled into an executable, it's going to be some minimal file size. Yeah. That's the only thing that hits disk, which is really neat. Um, unfortunate for defenders and stuff, but like really cool from a computer science -y perspective. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, vulnerability. Yeah, totally. Yeah, memory analysis. So this is why memory forensics is really important because obviously all this behavior is going to show up in memory. The outbound HTTP requests will show up on your network traffic. However, they are encrypted because it's HTTPS requests it makes. So this is where we get into the do we do like SSL stripping uh, on the exfil points from our network, or do we have to figure this out in other ways? Do we observe like where it's connecting to and stuff like that? Um, luckily, it doesn't do that like crazy um, DNS over HTTPS stuff. It doesn't have that bundled in, but somebody could add that really easily. So at least you can see the C2 server it's reaching out to. So if you were doing really good network traffic monitoring, you would see where this thing's trying to um, fetch its payloads from, at least. You wouldn't see the content, but at least you would see where it's connecting to, and then you can just like blacklist that IP address, um, and then problem solved from a defender standpoint. Oh, 
Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm sure they're like, if we sat down and we actually looked at some of the traffic, we could probably come up with like a more specific signature for whatever it requests. Yeah, totally. Um, interesting. And also like, um, as a side note, um, all the like encryption and decryption and encoding that it does, it generates like random keys on the fly. So there is no fixed key for all the encryption that it uses. Um, so every new agent program that you deploy will be encrypted with like a unique AES key and stuff like that. So it's quite robust in that regard. Um, it actually, they did a lot of things correctly. I'm not going to say well because it's supposed to be malicious, but they did it correctly. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Any questions about this thing? It's neat. Um, if you want to set up like a little environment at home and play around with it, um, I would recommend doing that. Understanding how these things work is important, especially if you want to become a pen tester. I mean, knowing how C2s operate um, is a useful skill because, you know, if you're doing this legitimately like for a paycheck and not a malicious paycheck, like a real paycheck, um, it, you need to know how to like build and run and operate C2 servers and stuff. Um, the code's not complicated. Um, you could patch it and modify it to add new behaviors and stuff like that yourself. So yeah, it's quite accessible as a code piece. It's just big, that's all. Cool. Anyways, thanks, everybody. Uh, and now we're going to set up for Adam. Thanks. Hopefully there's nothing incriminating. <laughs> Gonna like kill a quick process and then Jump to the washroom. I guess. I'll just want to check to see. And then if I do that, it's actually pretty good. Because then I can kind of cheat that way. Alright, I'll be back in like two minutes. Cool. Disconnected to your laptop? Disconnected to your laptop? Oh, um, I can just press the. Uh, oh, it's in it. Oh, it is? Oh, awesome. Yeah, thanks. Oh, 
it's actually still playing the stuff I was going to. Um, so it should still be good. Cool. All right. Let's give it just get started. Okay. Get started. Okay. 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 Right. We're gonna start. Hi everyone. So uh, for the project, then, so uh, I'm gonna talk about the Commons Room Booking program that I wrote. So just a quick summary. It's a command line uh, program that allows me to book study rooms um, using the command line. So it interfaces with roombooking.sheridancollege.ca. Um, it's written in Python version three. It's uh, available. It's publicly available on GitHub under the URL there. Um, and I, it supports two different use cases. Either you can pass the room that you want to book along with the uh, date and time and duration, or you can just pass the um, date and time, and then it'll list what rooms are available, and then you can enter in which rooms you want, which room you want, and then it'll book it for you. So why don't I quickly do a demo? Uh, right here. So basically, Let's hope that nothing's changed. So basically, it just it, there's command, different command line arguments. So I'm just running this in the directory, in the project directory, right? Like in the in this pri, uh, project directory. This is the py, the Python module. This is the room that I'm booking. Uh, I'm specifying tomorrow, but it supports a real date. Uh, this is the time, and I just want to book it for 30 minutes. And let's hope there has been deployments on Friday. Cool, so it just tells me that this room, no, it's unavailable. All right, that's fine. Then we'll just run the second part. Yeah, it would be really cool. <laughs> yeah. So basically it lists all the rooms that are available. Wow, so people like, I guess, are really trying to study right in the early in the morning. Uh, let's see, three, eight. I'm pretty sure I checked. <laughs> don't, don't ask to check because then the roots of magic. <laughs> um, so basically, I'm entering a room. It says the room is available, and it just kind of sends a request. And I should get an email saying that the room's available. Um, so yeah, basically. So these are the different Python libraries that I'm using. So I'm using request library for making the HTTP request to the web server. It's a really nice class. It returns back a response object and everything. So that's nice. Uh, arg parse, um, we've Nick's already covered a couple times. It just uh, handles my command line arguments. Uh, date time for date time operations. So uh, the program uh, prompts the user for a start date and duration. So we need to derive the end date date for like one of the requests. So date time allows me to do some the to add time to and uh, do date time operations. Uh, date parser, it's kind of like a natural-ish language, so it allows me to use like the tomorrow instead of like pass a date, which is convenient. Uh, also logging for like console log messages and different debug levels. Um, YAML for the uh, configuration file, so you need to specify your, your shared in single sign-on username and password uh, so that you can log in with the system. And then uh, JSON because there's JSON data that's on the web server that we need to scrape, and then beautiful soup because it's a web crawler. So yeah. Uh, so the project structure. Um, so we have a requirements.txt. So this lists all the libraries used. Uh, make file. So if you have make installed, you can just run make, and then it'll install your requirements. It the, it also configures a virtual environment, or you can just install it on your on your regular Python install. Uh, there's README, obviously, project documentation, and example usages come in really handy. Um, and then there's the config, so that stores your shared and single sign-on username and password, and then the main. So the way Python searches a directory is uh, either it looks at init.py or uh, main, and so in regards to main, um, that's that's the nomen that's the way you should name a program that's a standalone. So that's that. We have a logger class. We have date lib, parent lib, and request lib. Uh, those are the helper methods. So I'm just going to go over the flow um, quickly. So we have a login. Then we have. Then you have to click the link to access the form. Then you have to submit your date. There's another part up top where you can specify which uh, um, which campus you want to be on. But like we're just going to ignore that. Um, so after you enter in your start uh, your 
date information, the, your time information. You have to specify what date you want to book the room. Then you get a list of rooms, obviously. Select which room you want, and then it prompts you to confirm. And then, and then finally, you have to confirm. Uh, so I'm just going to go over how I kind of broke this down. So right here. Yeah, OK, so right here is the URL of the request. Uh, here's the HTTP 200. So this is the HTTP code that I get. This is the request that I'm sending. So this is my session, like a session cookie, right? So this is how it uh, handles like um, making sure that a user is authenticated. Uh, and then this is actually what the what we see the the um, request being sent, what the information sent to the web server. So we see here, oh, I just lost the mouse. Right here, for example, the time is encoded a little bit. Um, and then stuff like that. So yeah, this is kind of how I went through it. I just used like uh, developer tools to figure it out. Yes. Um, it took when I so I w I decided to use like uh, proper web crawler uh, framework, um, and that failed really badly. Um, so then when I did using the request method, it took about a weekend to put together. So yeah, it's, it's pretty like. It's, it was a bit, it took a bit of time to figure it out, but after that it was just like, once you figure out the like what the requests were, then the rest it was just like, you know, just usability stuff. Uh, so some observations from this one request. I can show you guys other requests as well, um, but for time's sake, I'll just show you that one. So there are no CSFR tokens to protect the form request. So we can just like treat this, uh, once we have the request, uh, URLs we can just kind of treat it as an as an API gate, API and just like toss the requests uh, without having to scrape uh, any information and most of the inf uh, forms are static anyways like the parameters are the same so uh, that makes things easy uh, session being maintained by session cookie so we just need to grab that when we're logging in and we should be good and then obviously the information that is required from the user. Um, so then just some of the challenges, so there were just a couple of tricky things. So for example, uh, Unix, uh, uh, instead of specifying the date, it was uh, actually an Unix timestamp. So we just needed to just like uh, convert it to Unix. Uh, the room name, so we're used to like C158B, um, but they use room IDs, which are pretty actually pretty long. Like you can see it right there, I believe. Yeah, right there. Um, and then also like time information is encoded. So I'll just show you how I kind of work through that. So extracting room ID from JSON. So within the HTML page itself, um, we see right here that there's an HTML tag um, that actually has JSON, a JSON right there in it. So basically what I did was I just copied this JSON, pasted it just for you guys to see. And then we can see here, oh man, I don't know if I'll be able to read from here, but um, basically we get the pieces of information that we want. So right here is the room name. Hopefully you guys can see that. Here's the room name. Here's like the campus. Um, and then this is actually the ID. So we're just like searching the string, like searching strings. Um, by cap like but I just captured one of the requests and I just searched for it. And that's basically what it is. And then this is actually the code that you see uh, interfacing with this. So um, within the request library, we get a response object. Um, and so we just, uh, and we also have the room name, which is what the user entered. So basically, uh, this is the first uh, method call. Then right here, it actually passes the response object to this second response object. Hopefully you guys, yeah, you can see that. I just can't see it on that screen. Um, so basically what we're using is, at, once we pass the response object, we just uh, grab the text from the response object and we turn like add it, create it like within beautiful soup. It just formats it nicely for me. Um, and then what I do is I have a try um, which allow which basically searches for the class list div and data list data. So that's unique enough um, to grab the inf this JSON string for me. And then all that I do is I just load it in as a, a structure. And then I just return that to this method here. Um, so yeah. And then here I just iterate over. So because it's nice and structured, this is actually like, uh, I don't want to get too much into it, but this bracket here is, can't really see. Oh. 
Okay. Uh, so basically here there's a bracket and then this is a whole list. Um, like this whole spiel, right? So I'm having a hard time seeing where. Which one? Yeah, I'm trying to use that one. Yeah, it's okay. In any case, so right there you see that there's like the big spiel. That's each room. So I'm just iterating over each room until I find the room name that the user specified. Um, if I don't, I just say that this room is unavailable um, because it only give me back rooms that are available. Um, so yeah, that's how that piece of kit, uh, piece of code works. Uh, so that so that string right there at the bottom, that last bit, um, that's actually static. It's like a resource ID, and yeah, it doesn't change. So yeah, you can do that. So eventually, you can just tell it the first time it runs, you can build a cache of rooms. Yeah, we could. I just decided to make it static in case for some reason they change. I just thought it would be a bit better. The way the first way that I implemented it, I actually saved the JSON, um, and then I just loaded that. But then I just figured, what if they change the room ID or something? So I just decided to go with this route. Um, so yeah, the JSON's a bit, it's not as very, it's not very readable, but all the information's there. And it's just kind of the way JSON is. Um, and then in regards to, so how they encoded time. So there's a list here. Uh, so there's just basically a drop down. So you can only list actually rooms by increments of half an hour. So we see right here on the uh, left, what it looks like in HTML. So I just copied that, put it into a dictionary, so a key value. So basically the key is the, uh, like the string that you enter in the, the time, and then uh, it passes me a value. So what's really nice is I'm just able to, once, I ha once a user enters in a time, it just like, it's just a quick operation just to grab the value and then return that. So that's what we see here in the return start time, uh, is it just basically like, this method, I pass the start time, it looks up what the value is and it returns it. Uh, in regards to getting the end time, it requires a bit more operation. So I actually specify a format there at the top. Um, then what I do is I use the date time library to uh, convert to date uh, time object. And then I just, delta time allows me to mess around with like offset. So I just offset it by how, much, how long the user wants to book the room for. And then I just use the um, get time code method to get the value, return that, and then it all works, usually. Um, and then, so basically, how my program is structured is this sequence is pretty like straightforward, like one after another. So I just created um, like a custom method called form request. Usually, how you interface with like APIs or like uh, those, yeah, usually through APIs, uh, is there's like a standard format that you use. So there'll be like a, a common way to like authenticate uh, the payload structure and like the URL you'll mostly have to cha change. So that's kind of what I did. So I kind of broke it down. Okay. So basically in this form request, this URL and payload, that's like my parameter. And then this is just like uh, the form values. And then over here, so it actually calls this method. So this is like a custom method that I just did to allow me to interface it with the request method. Oop. And so I just specify like this is a post request, the URL, payload. Um, and actually, so it checks if there's a, se a valid session. So I use a global variable to manage the session. Um, and so that's declared right at the top. Why am I lost? right at the top. And so basically what it is is if there's no session, it will log in. Uh, and that's, that'll go through that process over there. That kind of makes sense? Yeah, cool. And then improvements. So basically like, I like to like wrap my helper methods into a class. Um, so it just, it's a little bit better. Um, improve some error handling, cause like just checking, making sure that the date is in the right, uh, is like you can't book something in the pa in the past or in the too far in the future, um, but there's there's some there's like enough validation that like um, yeah there's there's enough to make it work but yeah uh, it could always be better and then also it'd be cool to do like a scheduling feature so if you want to book a room like a month in advance you can like schedule it in this program I think that'd be kind of a cool idea to explore um, so yeah uh, are there any specific questions. I can kind of show you guys the code if you want. We're pretty much good on time.
Yes? Yes? Sure. So why don't I actually duplicate my screen and then that way I can kind of see better. You guys can see my screen. Cool. So I have here, like, cool. Um, so for example, so when I actually go to, let me actually go to a new private window and then I'm going to do uh, inspect element. So I'm just going to go into network tab. So I have persistent logs on. So basically when I move from one web page to another, the, my network traffic gets saved. And also I disable my cache. So I'm just going to go to room booking. And so then if you see here in this get request, this is your, uh, you get a bunch of information here. So this is actually your response. In here, it will, there will be like a set cookie. Uh, let's see here, agent, accept, at the top, yeah. There you go. So that's basically like whenever you go, it gives you a cookie and then that gets persisted throughout. Um, so actually when I refresh the page, it'll just be a cookie. But when I first log in, it is a, under tag set cookie. And then what I can do is I can actually see what the cookie looks like right here. So. Have you logged in yet? No, I haven't. So that's why I'm sharing my cookie. <laughs> no, just, um, but yeah, so that's kind of how I well, well, am able to get. Yeah, so if I log in, you will have a different. So if I log in, right, you will see here the network traffic. I'm not going to get the post request for obvious reasons, but you'll see that there's actually like a cookie here. And then if I go in here, so for example, for this one, if I, for example, like verify calendar, I will see like a post request. So basically what I did was I just filtered out uh, all my post requests and I just looked in here, like just copied this. And then I just looked here, this is my cookie, right? So if I go into cookies, you'll see this uh, string there. Um, and then I'll see my params here. So this is my form data and this is actually what the request payload looks like. And then what my process was, was I like using Postman to make, uh, to basically make API calls. So basically what I did was I just uh, copied exactly what I had and just pasted it into Postman. And so what you can see is under uh, headers. So this is how they, where I put my cookie. Uh, this is an old cookie, but uh, this is my actual form right here. So I just pasted all the values in and then I start messing with it and seeing what information do I have to change if I wanted to, for example, set a different time or, um, or book a different room, how did that work? So I just kind of use Postman for that. And then the nice thing about Postman is actually if you press code, it will generate your like a Python request, uh, um, the code snippet right here. So it makes it really handy for like, you figure out the what your requests are in Postman, you do it manually, like go through the process, and then you just press code, copy this, paste it in, and then after that, I did a layer of like adding variables, and then okay, what are my methods? These are my methods, and then adding onto it that way. So it's a very iterative process. So yeah, I booked like a ton of rooms when I was developing this. <laughs> so yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes? Sorry, what exactly is Postman? It's my first time here, but... Uh, so basically what Postman does is it allows you to like create a bunch of like HTTP like requests. So this is actually how like Postman is an application mostly for dealing with like APIs. Um, and also like for example for like uh, what, we, what we're doing right here is making, is making like calls to web servers. So it basically allows us to, for example, specify, it's a GUI, GUI interface, which is really nice. So we can specify like a get or a post here, the URL that we want, um, our params, and it supports like all the different ways we can use this one. We can, there's like authorization as well. So it allows us to like handle like API keys or like basic authentication. Uh, like it allows me to handle it really nicely here. 
Um, so that's kind of, this is like my go-to for dealing with APIs. And I can also have like a folder here so I can organize my API calls the way I want. And like I can name them, save them. I can also save sample output. Um, and then like I can add like headers, body, and I can even like change the way so I can specify like raw or like uh, form data, which is the way I'm using. So it's just like a really flexible way um, to kind of get a grasp of an API. Because like I said, an API, you kind of, everyone implements them a little bit differently. Some will use like API tokens. Some you just need to pass the token. Sometimes you need a username. Sometimes the, you'll, you'll generate an API token, but you'll need to use like basic authentication to log in. Um, so you have to specify username, password. Sometimes they'll use like basic, but like just pass in, in your username, you pass the API token and no password. There's different ways of doing it. And then there's, also, like, um, if you get, like, JSON response, it, like, formats it nicely here. So, cool. so yeah. the GUI interface basically for all the stuff that you just listed. You can, yep. in theory, do the stuff that Postman just makes it, like, a nice... Yeah, like, I mean... Tools to do all that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's better to, like, figure out the flow first and then actually program it because, like, figuring this out in uh, Python, the programming language gets in the way. Um, so like I don't want to have to deal with like debugging or whatever. So I just kind of use this to kind of play around with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you see here like I have some of the GET requests because I really wanted to figure out what's going on. So yeah. Uh, Nick? Um, the flow that you were showing initially for like the room booking page. Yep. Is that actually like a sequence of requests or is, is that all like one giant page? I'm just trying to figure out like does, does the regular flow end up making a series of requests and you just kind of like did all that as one at the end? Or does it kind of like build the request as you go through the typical flow? Like it's no, going? it's actually the pain. It's every single time you press. So there's actually like every time you go through. So for example, this is one request, like like this specific is a, this thing here is a form. And then that actually reloads a page and it loads this piece. So then how initially, how was it building the final post that initiated the booking? Or do you actually need to make like one, two, three, four, five, six separate posting requests? Um, so you kind of have to create like like this time info one. I you can get like I don't think I make this one because I don't need to. And there's a lot of like repeated information back and forth. But if I want to, for example, see get available rooms, I have to send this like calendar, and this actually will resend back like like the time information and also the calendar information as well. So that's how I'm able to uh, bypass the, the submitting the time info. So you can just send this one and then you'll get like this response back. And then that's, you send this request as well. So there's like three at the bottom that you have to do. Gotcha. So it's not like it, it builds your final request as you're going through. It's more like it kind of creates this final page which would assemble the last request. Is that how the original act kind of does it? Um, it kind of, I'm not sure exactly how they do it on the back end, but it basically like this, like you have to have three requests. So you need to get available rooms. Um, but I believe actually, no, if, if you're just like, for example, in my, in mine, if I already passed the room that I want to book, uh, yeah, I can just send like a request to book this room. Yeah. Cause like you could jump to the final stage. Yeah. Yeah. You can. You can, yeah, yeah. Just you need the confirm and uh, to s send which room you want. But yeah, all the information, actually like the date, time information, and the room ID gets resent like multiple times. Yeah, so even with your confirm page, I can't just say, yeah, the, the thing that I booked, like just like I'm good with it. I have to send the whole information back, so, which makes like the request really long. Like uh, in here, uh, main, like some of them got a bit like long yeah. so yeah so but i'm resending back information multiple times so Can yeah I absolutely so you said there were no CSERP tokens right yes so have you thought about making a page that would like book all the rooms for somebody that like clicks on it um so the thing is, there's a different comp city control for that, <laughs> um, which is basically um, like I can't book, we can only book rooms for uh, like two hours. So, um, and that's basically like, I, so I can't just like send a bunch of requests 
being like, hey, I want to book like a room for like a whole day. Um, no, like it'll check to make sure that like I'm only booking, uh, the, uh, booking rooms for a maximum of two hours each day. So it actually does check that. Can you book like five rooms at once though? Um, I mean like, no, because it's in half an hour increments and uh, the, the smallest that I could book is for half an hour. But I mean, could, I, could you book room A and room B and room C all at the same time? No. Can I book a week worth? Oh, okay. okay. Okay, I no, you, I've never had to do this. I didn't yeah. know there was any kind of like throttling. Yeah, they, they check they check to make sure. So basically, like the way you do it is like they allow they allow you to book two hours, um, and also you can book a room uh, two weeks in advance. So like that system works perfectly fine. So that's why like the CSFR tokens like it's not a big deal because there's already different comp sitting controls in there. But somebody else just mentioned race conditions. So if you just spammed it. With requests, do you think you could actually slip in and actually book a bunch of stuff? Hey, we could. We could do it. So. <laughs> Not that Maybe. Just, if you do that, because you think <laughs> obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give you my credits and you can try it. Yeah. Oh, That's cool. Fine. Okay, yeah, sure. You're the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I made like a bunch of requests that failed, so I, I mean, like. You know, if, 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 do you have a bug bounty? <laughs> and then we can do it. Yeah, maybe we could. We should probably get like like admissions is to make like a preference of rooms you want to go to. Yeah. And then just say I want to book a room for this time, mm. and then it'll just automatically pick one for you. Basically. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. HMC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can actually filter by campus too. I just like didn't implement it, <laughs> and I, it just so happened that the screenshot that I took was a Brampton campus, and I was just like, eh. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> so, yeah. But Trafalgar, you see Trafalgar there organized nicely. Um, so, yeah. Um, like, so, yeah. So, if actually in the code. So, yeah, there's the logger. Like, I have different info and debug. Yeah. Good logging practices. Yeah. Yeah. The basically, when you, when you did that repo, I was like, awesome. And I fixed it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, any other questions, concerns? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe you mentioned. You can, hey, you can modify if you want. Um, the code's available. So, yeah. I mean, pardon? It's open source, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where's your repo link? Let's see that. Uh, it is. Does it have the proper license? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. So it's here. No, I didn't include license. Damn it. But I did put a disclaimer. So there's that. So yeah, here's the requirements. And actually, if you want to set it up, I just like listed the, the commands right here and the help. And then this is like sample commands. So the way I use the way I use it is I actually go to the um, help page and I just grab whatever one I want. Uh, and I grab one of these strings and then I just modify it and then I just run it. And it works pretty well. And since it's a it, like you can set specify for it to not use any in, um, uh, not require any human import, you could probably just schedule it to run uh, to kick off whenever you want. So yeah, um, any last minute? No. Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming. So yeah, and don't upload your shared and like username and password to this repo. If you do commit, just like letting you guys know. Yeah. So we do a two minute break and then uh, we'll get to the CPI challenge. I totally forgot that there's a second part. No, no, it's okay. Good job. Yeah? Yeah, that was really good. Dude, that's awesome. I love it. Thanks. I love it. Uh, Thank you. Do you want to use my laptop? No, no, I'll use it. Oh, <coughs> By the way, who's uh, coming to the pub afterwards? Cool. All right. Wait. Well, sorry. Sorry. Keep keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, we should call them.
A lot of people are coming for. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to be jammed in there because it's uh, <laughs> Friday before we get Oh, yeah. Because it's the like it's the Friday before the game. So probably a bunch of people like finished exams, maybe went for some drinks. I mean, I don't know how people party these days, but that's where we used to. I don't know if people still drink. I don't know if that's a thing. Essentially, uh, the description was like, um, you walk into a room, um, you, the smell of Fiona's lasagna uh, and fresh soccer fish fills the air. There's a bunch of Italians that are dead on the floor, okay? And you see on the table is this setup, right? And uh, this setup is Scopa, if you don't know what Scopa is, it's like a, a game that's like popular, Italians play all the time. You see the Italian flags there. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so the, the idea here, it was a crypto challenge, it's like a crypto corner. So this is kind of like my intro to crypto corner as well. Um, essentially, instead of seeing it like a picture like this, you will have the picture on your like CTF platform during the CTF, but really you're gonna actually go, um, there's gonna be like a table set up and you can actually go and like see sort of like the different crypto systems that are set up there. And they're all like really, really simple, but it's just like, if you walked into a room, people were encrypting something, could you figure out what they were encrypting? This is not my idea, by the way. This is uh, Josh uh, Schneider, who's uh, our crypto, and I think he's also a math prop. So some of you might have Josh right now. He's not going to be there, unfortunately, but he did create like some really cool challenges. This was me basically like trying to copy uh, what, what he did. Um, so maybe I'll start by Jem. Do you want to give us an explanation of how you found it? I'll be honest with you. I did it with a fourth year. And it took us like 15 minutes to do it. That's good. But uh, okay, so how we basically did it was first we wrote down um, the numbers three, seven, four, one, six, five, two, and underneath it we put the letters that you have over there in the exact order underneath the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at what the middle. This was after like the fifth time failing, by the way. So it's, that wasn't like it was. We looked at the middle finally at the end, and we said, all right. So if something is at three, then it's gonna get transposed, or I don't know if transposed is the right word, but we're going to turn three into number six, I guess, and move it to number six. I don't know I, I don't know how to really explain it, but whatever letter is underneath the number at the very bottom, 
you have to move it around, or I guess substitution cipher, right. into the number that it corresponds with in the middle row. Okay. That's good. And how many times do you have to do that? Twice. 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 Okay. Yeah. Twice. Or once, once with the middle. Uh, yeah, I thought uh, there's definitely two steps, but I thought we just did the middle part once, and then we did another in the top step. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's really two, it is two steps. Two steps, steps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so essentially this is actually used the, the, the correct word. It's, it's actually just a version of a transposition cipher that you're doing twice. So essentially this is a permutation. So what you end up doing is you assign each letter here to one of the numbers, right? So the, the, goal, the goal that I want to get into here is that not like, not like this is a hard challenge or an easy challenge, but how would you actually like approach this? So the first thing that you notice is that there's always rows of seven cards, right? The scope is there for decoration. I probably shouldn't have that in there. It would probably just add confusion. Um, but, and then the letters also have seven cards. So the first thing you should really be thinking of is, well, I should probably assign a letter to each of these numbers, right? Um, so each letter has an ID. And then you see that there's actually two in the middle there. So it goes on the bottom, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At the top, there's a question mark. So we're moving from the top down, so that's probably gonna be our plain text, down and then down again, and then that's our cipher text over there. So now we actually have to go backwards, right? So you just go in order, right? So you got three, seven, so if T is three, right? Then what you're gonna end up doing is you're gonna move the T over to that position. And if the S is seven, then you're gonna move the seven all the way to the very end there, okay? So now you have a new ordering, but it's still not gonna make sense, right? Because you're doing this twice. So then you're gonna assign the new identifiers, which are up there, so two, three, six, five, one, seven, and four. And then you're gonna, oh, oops, sorry. You're gonna assign the new identifiers and then you're going to do that process essentially again until you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Um, so honestly, it's it's like a, if you actually just like if you had it in your mind that this is a transposition cipher, this would be really easy. The challenge is that it's not the first thing that might come into your mind, right? And that's just how like CTFs work, right? The idea is that you're going to be fiddling with it. It's going to be really frustrating for a bit, and then you're going to get this one idea and then everything's gonna make sense. So even if you didn't get this, right, or you tried to get it, please don't be discouraged, right? That's the whole point. And there's gonna be like 10 to 15 of us walking around and answering your questions and giving you more answers, right? Um, so, yeah. Um, the other thing as well that you could have approached this is, okay, well, you don't really know how to apply the permutations, so each, each one of these here is a permutation, but, you know that this is probably some sort of reordering of the letters. Maybe you have like a hunch about that, right? So a different way of doing this is actually just take these letters, right? And um, you can actually just like write a script to like generate all the different combinations of those letters. And there's actually not that many. I'm gonna show you how many exactly. Um, and then what you will end up doing is you'll probably look for like dictionary words in there, right? So that's like sort of like the programming way of doing it, if you don't want to do it like the crypto way, right? So you have seven letters, right? So to, uh, and this is something you actually do in math one, so everybody here should know how to do this, right? Or, or what I'm doing right now. But if there's seven letters, then that means there are seven factorial combinations, okay? So seven times six, times five, times four, times three, times one, or sorry, times two times one, and that's going to end up being something like 4,960, which for a computer to brute force and to look through like seven letters, it's not a big deal, right? Um, the 4,960 is actually a bit wrong because there's actually duplicate letters here. So it's going to count this twice, right? This word, for example. So you can figure it out, but I mean, like, that doesn't really matter. Yeah, go ahead. Check the stream. The stream? Oh, is it not working? Help me. Um, yeah, and uh, the, the other thing as well is you should know like switch, have your computer with you, and either Kali or Commando, depending on what you like to use. Do you like Linux more, or do you like you know PowerShell and Windows more? Switch. 
Cali is generally, you know, it has every, everything you need. Easier than Salt Lake, that's right. I heard someone in the bookstore was talking about that. Yes, it, it, yeah, Caran does a bit of a, yeah. yeah. Mm, no, I don't think so. I, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't use Commando, but uh, from what I understand, like, it's actually, like, there's like a script that resets the timer. Um, apparently you can do that. Uh, but don't don't quote me on that. Like that's just something I heard from somebody off the cuff, kind of thing. But I can I can look into it. Um, okay. So the other challenge that I prepared here, it's actually uh, like a PCAP challenge. So this would be like a traffic analysis challenge. This is what you'd be doing on your computer, Crypto Corner. Maybe you're gonna go and like you're gonna have the picture, but you're gonna go and maybe take a look. It'll be like realistic a little bit more. You know, minus the dead Italians on the floor. I can't promise that. Um, so, if we take a look at this PCAP here, um, okay. why not TCP them? Sorry? <laughs> why not TCP them? <laughs> um, I'll do T Shark later. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow, you can do that. Uh, everyone can see that okay? Okay, cool. So yeah, um, a lot of the traffic analysis challenges, you're just gonna get like a, like a PCAP, right? Um, and then you're gonna have to basically figure out like maybe from the title of the challenge, there's like a little hint on what you should focus on. I, don't, I didn't have time to like assign like a, like a title and a, and a description, I just made this like, this morning. Um, uh, also this, this challenge is like a like very obvious, it really is like a 10 to 15 point challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, it, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like later. But uh, essentially, you're going to have to take a look through the traffic. We're going to make them such that, you know, I'm not just legitimately, like, there's like 16 different types of traffic in there, and you have no idea what to look at, and you're wasting time. No, it's going to be like, there's going to be two protocols in there, and you're going to have to maybe, like, figure out what is being sent over a network, or something's being exfiltrated, how is that happening, um, stuff like that. So let's take a look at this one. Sorry? No, no, no. Uh, so, so the the way it works is that you just have like the six or seven hours or whatever it is to do the workshops, do the challenges, do the lock picking, do all of it. Whenever, yeah, whenever you want to do it, it's up to you. How? What's your strategy? It's up to you. through the game and actually telling you like specifically like how to get places and what to do and where things are happening. A lot of that detail I can't just put in a package otherwise it will be like 30 pages long, right? <laughs> yeah. um, okay, cool. So let's, let's uh, do this one. Um, so uh, I look at this, uh, he, uh, this, this uh, PCAP here. And uh, what we see is basically just a lot of like TCP traffic. Um, there's some like ARP in there. Uh, primarily, like what do you what do you notice? Maybe just like mention things. Ubuntu. Just like really obvious things. Root. Root. Where do you see root? Oh my god, that's awesome. Uh, what what else do you see? Like what about the IP addresses? Is there like a pattern to the conversation? Exactly. So it's the same two hosts essentially speaking with each other, right? Um, so so pretty simple. There's a conversation happening here. You start seeing maybe like in the data here, some you know uh, strings, right? Like host name, root, groups, root, who am I, right? Stuff like that. Um, so, does anyone know how to like follow a TCP stream in Wireshark? No? It's okay. It's very easy. Wireshark, honestly, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. Like, Wireshark challenges, any PCAP, don't try like really hard to, to you know, do something like magical. Like, there's definitely like a feature that, that Wireshark has built in, right? Like, Google, 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 
um, as much as you can. That's totally okay. That's the whole point. Okay? It's to teach you how to find information. So uh, it's really easy. You just go here, follow TCP stream. And Wireshark just basically assembles that TCP stream for you. Okay. Um, you see there's like a who am I, groups, host name, you name dash A. Does anyone know sort of like when would you run these commands? Like fingerprint what OS you run? Yeah, exactly. That's one reason. So like what's the first thing like an, an attacker would do when they just yeah, they, yeah, exactly. Who are you? Right? So, yeah, you just got a reverse shell and you want to see, okay, who are you? What's the host name? What's its IP address? What groups exist on the system? What processes exist on the system? That kind of stuff. Okay? Um, so, you know, you see this TCP stream and, you know, they cat the slash Etsy slash password file. Does anyone know what that is? Um, not exactly, but. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. user information, exactly. Um, and then the passwords are actually stored in slash Etsy slash shadow here, right? Um, they look at like maybe some, you know, SSH information. It looked like they checked if there was like an SSH uh, like daemon on the system. Nothing came back, so probably not, right? Um, obviously there's like an SSH client on every, on every Ubuntu machine. Um, they checked for GCC-V, that didn't return anything why and then you get to the bottom here and it says the flag is the first 10 digits of the SHA-256 sum of the salt of the user IS sessions okay so this is what I meant when it's like this one's like really really obvious um, but so like we said before where would we find a list of users shadow. yeah exactly or password and then shadow as well yeah um, Salt, does anyone know what that is? Delicious seasoning. Delicious, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, not, not too far away from, okay. Oh my god. Wait, no, no, never mind. No, <laughs> no. Um, you're, 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 I think you're confusing that with, with like the seed value. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. But actually, Nick, Nick mentioned this in his secure software development class. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I'll go with you first. Oh, sorry, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? So you add salt to a password. So if two users on the same system have the same password, then um, they don't end up having the same hash. So it, it makes things a lot harder to crack. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, okay. So where can we find that hash? Well, oh, why did I get rid of that? Oops. Come back. Okay. Um, where would I find that? Well, right here. So in the slash sc slash shadow file. So you've got this here. Right? But how can we tell the salt? Right? So this is like the point where I'm like, I didn't know this when I was writing this challenge, to be honest. So this is where I would expect you to like go on, you know. Firefox or whatever, um, and then go, okay, well, let's look up the structure of the um, slash Etsy slash uh, shadow file. So if we go to here, I think this was the one I was looking at. So you go here, okay, like usable encrypted password, locked password. These are the nine fields, okay. So the second field is the encrypted password, oh, which contains three parts, like the hash algorithm, the hash salt, and the hash data. Right? So then um, we see here, for example, okay, this refers to the hash algorithm. This is the salt. And then this is the, uh, the hash itself, right? So all these three things here, right? So just quick Google first result, right? Um, very simple. A lot, of this a lot of the challenges you're encountering are going to be like this, right? The first result on Google is going to tell you a lot of what you need to know. 
the point is it's you know it's it's something that is um, you know we're not like trying to test you on like some niche niche thing right it's a student CTF the goal is learning the goal is breadth not depth okay um, and you see here okay well the the number here actually is, so a six means uh, shot 512 but actually if we take a look at our thing here we see that it's actually a one and a one is MD5 which is like a lot easier to crack and is like a flawed algorithm right so um, that's probably not good like if you're gonna harden the system you probably should up that to like SHA-512 or something like that um, it's interesting actually I'm not sure why it's dollar one because on my host, and I'm using Ubuntu on it. Sorry. Yeah, you said SHA. Oh, sorry. F um, yeah, on on my host, it's um, it's SHA five twelve. But for whatever reason, on the VM, it didn't turn out to be dollar one. So I'm not sure why. Um, maybe maybe it's because like when the VM created the user, because I know you can do that. Maybe it defaulted to MD, uh, MD5. So. Um, okay. So essentially, now that we know that, right? You can you can essentially. Um, oh, come on, why is it doing? Now that you know that, right, so this becomes um, really easy, right? I mean, you just have to take essentially this value, get the SHA-256 sum. So can I copy? Yes, I can. So if I go here um, and I open a new tab, so if I do echo-n, and then this here into SHA-256 sum. Um, so I would get that, but I want the first 10 digits of that, right? So I would go um, cut, right, dash B, I think, and then it's like 1 to 10. I don't know if that'll actually work. We'll see. Yep, there we go. And then you would essentially have to enclose that in like flag curly braces, and you've got the flag. Okay, pretty simple. Um, so this, this would be like... Can I ask a question? Sure. Because I know this comes up in CTFs a lot. Can you explain why? Oh yes, that, that's a really the consequences of not doing this. Yes, uh, that's a really good point. So um, the dash. So essentially, if I if I did not put the dash in there, you're going to see that the hash changes significantly, right? Um, and that's because the, what the dash. So if I go into man echo um, and I go dash n, do not output trailing new line, right? So remember. Echo by default is going to output a new line afterwards. So you should have learned this in like your first Linux class. So if you include that, that's not technically part of the salt. So you would get the wrong answer. So please, you know, make sure during the CTF you do that. And that could be like a stupid thing that's just happening that you can ask any one of us at any point in time, and we'll tell you right away. Right? Dash out. Okay. Well yeah. Yeah. That's actually a, a probably a good idea. Yeah. I should probably have that. Part. The description. Um, okay, so I mean that solves the challenge. But um, what if I asked you, for example, like I don't know, like ha, you know, I gave you a PCAP and I asked you what is the most frequently occurring IP address in that PCAP, right? Then it becomes much harder. You can't just go and like count the rows, right? What if I give you like fifty thousand lines? Okay, so your goal always should be to try and like. Uh, not automate, but like, op yeah, like optimize the process kind of thing. So a different way of doing this, um, really I'm using this as an excuse to kind of extract information. So we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to extract that salt from this PCAP, but through like command line utilities, uh, which is the last point that I want to make today. And that is really know those like, like Linux 1, like that first course, is really, really, really important in CTFs, right? Knowing those little command utilities, especially for like sysadmin challenges, is really important. Okay, they're going to help you a ton. And instead of like going and writing a script to do something like in Python or whatever, that little command line utility probably has that built in. Okay? So let's, let's go through that. Um, so I'm going to use T Shark, and T Shark is the um, command line version of Wireshark. Okay. So T Shark, uh, thankfully, so if I go into the main page here, has really cool ways of actually extracting columns from a, um, from a uh, PCAP. So if you see here, I've actually already done this. So I, I made like a custom column called data, and this just tells me if there's data in the column, right? 
But if you go here, so let's go into you know any one of these, and I go all the way to the end here, um, you can see. Oh, whoops! Sorry. Give me one second. Yeah. If I go into the data here, you can see there's like this little thing here. It says data dot data, and that's actually like the key value for that column in Wireshark for that field. Okay. So if you go into you know man t shark so let's go back so man t shark right and I go and I look up for you know dash t and I keep going until I find it okay set the format of the output when viewing decoded packet data um, and these are sort of the options so basically t allows me to specify how I wanna, how I want to output the data on the command line of a column in my Wireshark capture okay. Um, so I can do it to JSON, I can do it to fields. That's another thing. Maybe I don't give you a capture. Maybe I just give you a bunch of JSON and you have to go and parse it, right? So that's another way to do it, right? JSON is like used all, all over, right? In like threat hunting environments and stuff like that. So um, if I do T shark dash T and it needs me to specify how I want to output it, which is fields. And then I do, uh, so I, then I want to specify the fields, and the, the switch for that is dash E. And so the switch is called data.data, .data, right? And then I want to read from, what did I call it? Challenge, yeah, challenge.pcap. And I just click enter, what do I get now? I get this whole, basically all the data here. It's essentially what this is doing, right? So when I follow that TCP stream, but now it's actually in hex. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to figure out how to actually get this data back into, um, how do I want to get this data back into like, like text, right? Like ASCII, okay? So the way to do that would actually be to do like, you know, X, XD. And XXD is like typically used for like, um, like you want to dump a binary in hex. That's what you would use. But it also can go the other way around. So if you have a bunch of hex and you want to patch it back into binary, you can, you can do that as well. So if you do xxd and then you do you know, dash uh, reverse, so that's what the dash r is. And again, every time you, like, you, know, you know what the utility you have to use is, but you don't know exactly what switch to use, you can always go on the man page and look through there. Right? That's also another important skill. Nobody knows everything. right? Like I have to look this all up. Okay. Um, so xxd-r-p, and I think this is probably going to fail. Oh, it didn't fail. Wow. That's really cool. OK. Never mind. Um, so what I thought was going to happen was that this was going to fail because I have all of these colons in the middle here. right? So what I was actually going to do initially was to do like a, like a sed, and then I want to substitute all the colons with nothing globally. And then this returns all the columns uh, without that. And then I would pipe it to xdd, or sorry, xxd dash r dash p. And then it would give me that output again. Okay. So now I know I'm looking for this IS sessions user, right? How do I find the IS sessions user? Well, I can pipe that to egrep. Right, and uh, does anyone know what e grep does? Have you guys done grep first first years? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, cool. Um, so you can you can pipe it to that, and then I want to look for like IS sessions. So maybe we'll do like I I maybe you know it's capitalized, maybe it's lowercase, whatever. Um, and you know IS sessions, you know sometimes the two S's you know in I ISS are capitalized. So we'll do like S S. Right, so that's a char character class. So I can this will return either i or small i, either s or big s. We want this one um, once or twice, right? And then uh, we can just do like i sessions or whatever. And then um, let's see if that works. And it does indeed work. So, but we still want really the line that we want is this one, which actually contains the salt. So maybe, you know, this is like a little bit hacky, but you can do um, like colon underscore underscore dollar, right? So here I'm escaping my underscore and then dollar. And then I got that line and only that line, right? And then 
now I, I actually just want this like salt, right? So how do I get that salt? Does anyone have any ideas? Another command line utility. Yeah, exactly. So we, we can use cut. So, okay, so I do cut. Um, and then I'm gonna, I need to specify what the delimiter is. And the delimiter here is, which is really nice, is again colons, as you can see. So I do delimiter colon. And then I do, I want the second field, right? So now I have that. And then I now have this, so I can see that again, we, we mentioned here before that this is the algorithm, this is the salt, and then this is the hash, the salted hash. So now I probably, oh shit. So I probably wanna cut again, dash D, and now the delimiter is gonna be a dollar sign, and I want field two. Oh, that didn't, yeah, that didn't work because there's actually a dollar sign at the beginning, right? So right here. So it counts this as field two, but what I want is actually field three. I've got the salt. And now, <laughs> but by the way, this, this is probably like the really dumb way of doing this. I think there's like a, there's like a grep for PCAPs, right? So you can probably just, just use that instead. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, like that's not something that you're taught, so I'm, I'm doing it, yeah. Um, so, so then you pipe it to, you know, SHA-256 sum. Oh, complete, damn it. Um, I do. How am I gonna do this, one second. Yeah. Can I? Can I? Oh, that's true. That is true. So I can do. So yeah, to, to strip the new line now, it, you know, it becomes like a, a little bit more complicated because I have like a whole bunch of stuff in the background. I guess you can put like backticks and then like echo that dash n. But oh no, no, that still includes the new line. So no, that doesn't work. But you can do tr dash d to, for delete, and then you can do. I'm going to just delete the new line there, right? So now I'll, I'll show you what actually happens. You see this line printed right after the salt, so that means there's no new line character here, right? So right. So anyway, so that like that, and then I'm going to do SHA-256 sum, come on. SHA-256 sum, um, and then we're just going to do what we did before, so like cut um, dash B, um, no, so that should be, what was it? Sorry? It was one test. Right, yeah. It's like this. I don't remember. Yes, it was. Okay. That's it is. That's what it is. Oh. Take the whole command and just use it as in like an echo and then put a flag and then the command and start it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, let's, let's try that. So, oh God, okay. What is it? Control A? Right. So echo, what were you thinking? So echo flag. Yeah, so quotation mark flag. Okay. And then what do you do? Curly brackets, right? So you, uh, and then, so you, it's smaller, it's the single quotation for the like regular text, and then double quotation for the command uh, encapsulated in a so single quotations here. Single quotations for the text. Yeah. Oh, I see what you said. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. It's like this, and then we're gonna run this command, right? Yeah. So yeah, double quotations for the command first. Double. Okay. Oh, right, because it's yeah, because there's new lines. Yeah. Or something. Like spaces. I'm, I'm using the, the back text, which is the, the same thing, yeah. Oh, that didn't work. Let's try, let's try. And, uh, boom. 
Why is that not working? Oh, that's why. Yeah. Sorry, no, I don't understand. What do you mean so, the quotes? So double quotes is on is it's double quotes then curly uh, dollar sign curly brackets. So text is fine, yeah. So quotes. here. Yeah, you still need that single quote. Like Whoa. This is getting complicated. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> so we're going to so we're going to curly bracket. Okay. Close it off with finishing it with a single quote. Okay, so finish off with a single quote. So you know how you opened up text with a single quote playing. Yeah. Curly bracket. Now we're going to close it with a single quote. Then we're going to start the Okay. Okay. Okay, remove the double quote before T sharp. All right, okay. And then remove the, let's go to the end. Yeah, remove that. Um, is that curly bracket? No, it's a round bracket. Uh, it, it should be curly brackets for. Most people would just copy and paste this. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but it's okay, it's okay. Keep going. Single quote, curly bracket at the end. Uh, yeah, close it off. And then don't forget the double quote just after the, uh, the round bracket. Just after the round bracket. You really understand your <laughs> quoting. Okay. Uh, and then the single quote, yeah. bracket. Yeah. Okay. That. No, no one's just going to like the round bracket. Okay. This is going to work? Uh, what does everyone think? <laughs> Anyone want to place bets? <laughs> I use curly brackets for You gotta get the teaser out. Let me try. It worked! Oh. Nice. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Uh, yeah, so, so like the, the point of doing it this way is again, like the point of doing it this way is again, like if you want to like, I don't know, count the number of things, for example, you're going to have to do it like this. You can't just read something from a PCAP. If you have to handle like a very large volume of data, you're going to have to, you know, use cut, use paste, and move it around, right? So really know your command line. That's going to it's going to help a lot. Okay. So that's just something to uh, to practice. Um, and like I just demonstrated, I have no idea what Clinton just did, and uh, I'm sure this is not true, but maybe he has no idea about something that I did, right? Um, it it like. You have team members. Use those team members. They can help you. Um, that's why it's a team exercise. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, that's the other thing as well. Like for the workshops, um, only one of you can actually go. Like two people from the one team can't go to the same workshop unless like space allowing kind of thing. So you're gonna have to figure out among yourselves, okay, who's interested in what, what workshop do you have to go to? Are any workshops running uh, concurrently? There are, yes. Um, yeah, there's, there's always, actually, always two workshops uh, running at the same time. Okay. Yeah. okay. Hopefully this was like helpful as to the type of things that you're gonna have to do. Um, this is, I've, I've only demonstrated two categories. There's like eight, right? Um, on March 6th, we're gonna do like even a more involved version. It's going to be like our CTF kind of tutorial. Um, so we'll have actually Owen, um, Owen, um, I have no idea how to pronounce his last name, Co Cocogen? Cummings. Oh, Cummings. All oh, right, right. Never mind. Right. Never mind. Yeah, Cummings. Owen Cummings. Um, and uh, he's going to be doing a talk on uh, election security. That's going to be really cool. Um, he's, he's actually worked uh, for. Uh, a SOC that's related to, to uh, like Elections Canada for, for two years now, so it'll be nice. Um, and then after that's done, we'll get into like CTF stuff the whole day. It'll be really fun. We'll probably have more time, so I'll actually probably give you like some of the challenges. I'll give you like 10 minutes to do some of them. Um, and then every like 
week or so until the CTF happens, there's going to be like a warm-up challenge that's posted, and then you can go and, and you can try to do it yourself. Okay. Um, they'll, they'll be easy. Um, and then, or actually, maybe we'll try to ramp them up in difficulty just to kind of show you everything. But any, any questions at all? Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, where are you going to get the answer for the transition? Oh, right. Yeah, I never actually told you what the answer is. Um, so yeah, this just uh, goes to let's CTF. Um, by the way, actually, I totally forgot to mention this. Applying two permutations, is that more secure than one permutation? What do you think? No, no right? Because in between like, these two permutations, you can actually sum these up into one permutation that produces the same result. So a program that just you know, goes through every single combination is basically just going to look for that one permutation. There's actually no more security added by doing it twice. Uh, it was more so that I just wanted to um, use the whole deck and <laughs> put fancier pictures on there. <laughs> OK. All right, hopefully that was helpful. Thank you very much.